clamp. So again, I'm not going to cut the strings off yet, even though we, we could be tempted to. You get some super glue. You don't want too much, you just need to stop it from going sideways. So I'm going to put a little bit on there, a little bit on there. I'm going to put this back in here, line it up flush to begin with, with the edge in case it sticks quicker than we expect. And I'm going to load it up, and you see how much metal dust is on the frets at present. I'm going to load it up with strings, if I can get them on without moving the nut, which would be ideal. Tighten from the middle outwards, and then we'll leave it set that way. Under load, under load. Actually, it looks like it feels like it's further down, but it can't be. It's not, not possible. Yeah, it's good. Just that one that's slightly higher. I might just take care of that first. Let's get a note again. Okay, so now we've got that gluing the nut in place. We've got a nice low action. It's so close. I'm, I'm not going to do anything with it just yet. I'm going to let it glue. Um, it's very close to being right. You wouldn't notice it. It's just my over, over perfectionism. Okay, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to let this set and come back to it. Um, see you in a minute. Cool. I think I'm coming to you. Flash. Yeah, it's running. It's on, but you sort of would expect it to flash. Well, I don't know. I'm coming to you via <coughs> the relatively new Sony AD50 camera. But anyway, that's not so important. The important thing is I'm jumping ahead of the game here a minute because I, I was going to leave this till tomorrow to get started, but I've started a bit early, so I thought I'd better update you. What we've got here is the first valves for guitars and this is a nice TV yellow um, Epiphone SG thing and it is incredibly neck heavy a um, couple of reasons really I mean well not a couple of reasons one reason why is because the neck is heavier than the body um, and even that's even the case while the neck is set into the body quite some distance it's a bolt-on neck um, but they, on these guitars, to try and counter the head heaviness, they set the neck deeper into the body, and it also allows them to to um, allows them to use a sort of regular style neck without having to have an extended heel, um, which is okay when you're building it and gluing it and then covering it up in pick guard from scratch, but less attractive if you're I guess you're making a bolt-on thing. I don't know. Anyway, um, but they they do this, so they sink the neck quite a way into the body, sort of four frets in. Um, which on a lot of other guitars cures the neck heaviness but not on this thing because this body is the lightest thing I've seen in a very long time and it's, uh, it's some sort of well, it's basswood of some I guess um, now just I've been doing some stuff off camera now what I'm going to do with this guitar is we're going to replace the pickups um, Al supplied some of the pickups uh, I'm having a look at the, make sure the switch works okay and the pots work okay. I've just given them a shot of cleaner and I'll listen to them a bit later on. Um, so what I'm going to do is set this up, um, change the pickups, and the other key thing is to counterweight, counterweight, counterbalance this, this body. So off camera, I was <laughs> working with a little bit of lead I pinched off the church roof. Joke! Um, yeah. Um, and I made a little template and it made me a little block of sheets of lead that will fit 
into this compartment on the back. And there was a limit to how many pieces of lead I could fit, obviously, because it has to sort of sit just above the pot tops. And lows and behold, it does. And actually on weighing this, we've got ourselves half a kilo of weight, which is a nice little added weight. Funnily enough, that's only just enough to balance it, but it's going to be considerably better than it was. Um, now I was about to get into screwing it back in and starting the video again tomorrow, but one of the things I'm going to have to do with this straight away is to fill in these <coughs> these screw holes here. They're, they're worn out. Um, they don't have really much in the way of much variety in terms of gauges of stuff to use. I'm going to have to use the old toothpicks and some glue. Uh, I suppose I could do a resin fix. That's one way and you still have to drill. But then you're drilling and fitting into resin and given that the cavity screws are something that you routinely expect to be off and on regular like, um, then it isn't something you really want to um, you don't want something uh, hard like resin in there. So it is better that we have some wood, but well, this thing, oh, brilliant, this thing goes, <laughs> that's perfect positioning, not. That goes straight through into the hole that the, uh, str the cavity that strings go through. So I'm gonna have to somehow glue and fill this up, re-drill it without cutting any of these wires. That's a bad piece of design. Um, and I'm not even sure I can do it without a load of uh, glue going through into the wires anyway. Um, I don't have any, I'm out of the good old fashioned black goo, which known by another name is a resin, two pack resin of the quick acting stuff. I'm short of that, that would have been a bit, I've got, I've got reasonably quick acting stuff. Um, I'm just wondering whether I can find a way of plugging this uh, so that if I can push something into there just to block the hole. I don't want it clagging up the, um, I don't want it really clagging up the, what do we call these things? Wires. That's not ideal. That's not going to work. What is going to work? Anybody? Anybody for me? Somebody to. Well, that might work, but. Oh, if only I had a variety of different widths of wood. I'm certainly not going to want to drill this in order to fill it. I'm going to do a couple of bits, but this goes, this is terrible, it goes straight through. Um, I can't really relocate it because you just get left with a, a visible hole. So it's, it's got us by the sharpened, sharpened curlies. Um, see, so yeah, you can see I'm looking for something to put under there. We'll lock this off, block this off, stop us gooping whatever we use through there. Um, possibly, possibly, probably not. So anyway, um, so I just had a quick play of this in the house and I have to say I quite like the sound of the pickups and I've been relatively impressed with it's not going to work is it relatively impressed with epiphone pickups um in previous situations maybe this will go in and stay up you never know it's only temporary um yeah i've been i quite like epiphone pickups but al wants to change them so we will do that he's got some stuff, uh, some pickups kind of ready to go. Now this we can fill but I can't really get much of a grip. This this screw is never going to really do well unless we push resin in here and then we're going to get one, we're going to be struggling, or the, this guitar will always be struggling to preserve that hole and the only alternative is to make a new plate and move the hole somewhere else um, which is a bit of a in the thingies. Yeah, there's so little material, just there's hardly, there's nothing to drill through even. That's a waste of space. 
but we need it because without it, um, one side of that panel is going to stick up. I'm going to make an executive executive decision here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put another hole in this. This is this is a badly just stupidly placed, you know, at the outset. This is crap. What we need is we need a hole here alongside. Um, now I'm thinking functionality rather than aesthetics, you know, and plus the fact that you only ever see the back of the guitar yourself, so it isn't a big dealio. So I would recommend that we have a hole here that'll do the job just as well. In fact, that hole is about the same distance in. Um, and then what we could do for this one, we could actually fill it with something. Now I'm not going to get a chance to do that today because I don't have any black resin to fill it with. But you can either you can either put a dummy. Um, a dummy, a dummy, a dummy. Am I looking for the word I'm looking for? A dummy screw head, um, which would be a simple way of just filling that in, and gluing it down. You could use any kind of material then to do that, or we could, um, we could get some resin and um, just basically fill it in flat. I'm taking an executive decision and I'm going to move this hole. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to just check the hole diameter. The hole diameter, hole nine yards. Um, I'm going to, this is not quite big enough, but it'll do. I can better to have it slightly small and then Increase it as we go and to start too big. And then we go for the countersink. Yes, so it's probably simplest to fill it with a dummy screw head, but then just leave it because if you fill it with dummy screw head somebody one day will come along and try and undo it and that will cause it to break off and it will just you'll end up with the same result right now we're going to make ourselves a little counter sink quite quick that's the way it works size we just need to slightly expand it with a crude mechanism like this now on top of this there we go same size so on top of this we've still got to fill out these holes in the traditional fashion i.e. with some glue and cocktail sticks because and then we'll leave it and this will be the end of today's video exciting partly also it's good because I want to check that this cheap Chinese lens that I've got to protect the um, whatever that thing is, you know the thing, um, real lens, um, stop it getting scratched like the last one. Um, I paid a couple of quid or very little to get this all the way from China via AliExpress. So I'm looking for, I'm well, gonna hoping that it's gonna work really well, not add any further distortion. This. I've realized since I've started using this camera, by the way, that this um, aspect on this video is not the full wide angle that I think the other camera was running at. So I don't know whether I need to, or if I, well, don't know if it's okay. I mean, I have to probably make sure I get more in the picture than um, previously. Okay, so right now, all I'm concentrating on is getting these little things, sweet little things, um, filled up and having the glue set really so I just want to make sure there's plenty of glue around when they go in they're not exactly very snug fitting 
wonder why I should try and add a bit more. Oh, thank you, there's one right there. Actually, I probably can add a couple on each one. Um, maybe that's not very deep at all anyway, but there. Uh, Here you go. Here you go. So that, I'm putting a spiky one in with a blunt one so we get a bit of extra jamming going on. We're jamming, we're jamming, we're jamming, we're jamming. We're jamming. Mm -hmm. Not very easy to, to do. Right, I think we should just leave that like that for the night. What time even is it? It's half seven. I was thinking about whether to go out and see someone play. Uh, but it's about half an hour's drive. And the problem is it's a pub. And well, it's not a problem, but I only kind of like being in pubs when I'm playing. And I'm not exactly, by that I don't exactly mean I even like being, being in pubs. But, that's when I don't mind being in pubs. They're not my favourite kind of place. I occasionally have a beer, but very rarely. Usually only when I'm playing. Or when it's very hot when I'm playing, but I kind of stopped drinking much years, years ago and don't really. Um, okay, so I'm gonna leave that there with its neat little package. That's on top, just in case there's any ground or there was any risk of grounding out which I don't think there will be now um, and then we'll come back to that tomorrow that will be our fun, fun for the day but a good solid setup now I've got a pile of little bits and I've got to find a home for somewhere else and some of it uh, this has been modified right? some of it I'm going to Put in the, a box over there, which is a massive to be sorted pile. In fact, all of it I'm going to put in the to be sorted pile. I'm going to have to find a new home for it. All manner of things I didn't know existed. Ferals, ferals, incredibly long machine bolts with sockets on the top. Wonderful stuff. Right, all goes into that box of scary, scary looking box of things to sort out. Get in there. I'm running out of space there as well. Okay, so that's kind of nearly ready for tomorrow's fun. And like I said, this is going to be a straightforward setup. Um, this guitar has a couple of cracks here on the neck pocket, but that's no big deal. So, um, setup, pickup change. Um, I have to go and look at my notes to see which set. We've got two pickup changes. One of uh, the four guitars that uh, Al's brought to set up are this one, Epiphone SG. He's also bought an Epiphone Les Paul. Um, and he's brought a Japanese Fender, highly modified Japanese Fender, kind of favourite one. And also, um, Telecaster, Japanese Telecaster, which we're going to switch the bridge on and change the pickup to a P90 in the bridge position. So lots of interesting stuff, um, but we'll kick off tomorrow. Sorry for this wandering intro. We'll kick off tomorrow. With the rest of this SG, that's our job. And then on Tuesday, it'll be Router Tuesday again. And there's quite a few little things to do, but not a massive amount of noise, thankfully. Um, got a lot of necks currently in the house being hand finished. I've got a couple of little things to fix. This is going to be a custom, it is a custom neck pocket for the next Trekkie um, travel guitar that I'm making. Um, which is this great big, well, small, but currently very heavy. I'm going to take another six mils off this. It's going to be about 45 mils thick, um, but we're going to use this um, this custom uh, pocket 
template, which is taken, which fits exactly the actual neck that's going on here. So it's actually the neck is slightly bigger than um, a conventional Telecaster pocket. So sometimes when you see there's a difference, when you know you can use sometimes you can use the standard one, but sometimes when you see there's a big big difference between the neck you're actually using and the um, and the standard pocket template, then you you just have no choice. You have to make your own, and you have to do it very accurately because you know the neck fitting is is kind of like the heart of the guitar really. Um, so okay, that's that and that's that. Um, I'll see you tomorrow. Well, I've been fiddling around trying to. Um, figure out how to widen the angle on this and without reading the book I don't know the answer. So Morris I'm going to need to carry on with some work here because today is SG day. Oh hang on I've got to plug the power in. Hold on. Fiddle fiddle twang poke. There we go. Ah, oh sorry. Well that's too easy to do isn't it? Cut the video off. So because I haven't got such a wide angle I have to be cautious now about where it's pointing, more cautious, which is something I was trying to avoid. Ugh, lead on the floor. <laughs> Screwdriver over there. Um, right, so T9 over here. Some sanding tomorrow. Stay there. Some templates there. A small drill bit, a micro caliper thing, digital calipers, a weighing thing back in the house needs to go, and some bits and pieces. Right, let's get on with the SG. So, as you saw, a bit of lead, as you saw just recently, uh, we've done the lead part, ready to go. Um, next is the setup part, and this should be enjoyably fun. Now the thing about the setup is we were going to one second we were going to oh hellfire too much stuff in the way there is <laughs> I can't see anything this is silly yeah, it's very silly come on I need to rearrange this because I'm having to do that to get to my brush. It's not a good thing. I've taken the rubber thing off actually because even though it only costs a few quid, it's, it's actually a pain. So I think I'd rather work with these cheap carpety bits than the slipped mat thing that I was using. So uh, let's put this somewhere sort of that way. Okay. Right, the thing about this see, guitar is that we are going to set it up with hybrid slinkies or ultra slinkies which are 10s to 48s which are probably heavier than what's on here at the moment. We've also got an alignment issue here which is a bit too far in favour of the base side of things. So we're going to need to adjust that, or, or Al wants me to have a go at adjusting that, or correcting that if we can. So we've got the weight organised. Um, I'm pretty confident the switch works okay. Um, having sprayed some stuff in it and giving it a bit of a push around, I'm pretty sure that'll be fine. So what I'm going to do, first off, is I'm going to do, I'm going to set the action, the three components of action that I normally set and test out the playability of it um, and then decide whether or what degree of leveling it's going to require. Um, so the first fret action is a little high which we'll take care of in a minute and we'll start by doing the neck relief. At the moment, by the way, by the by, <coughs> the last fret action on this is a whopping just over three mils so we can halve that on this guitar, possibly a little bit more. And we've got an action down here, which isn't too bad, but we could again check that and make sure everything's right on that. So first thing I'm going to do is check the neck relief, which is practically flat, which with an SG you can tend to get away with. So I'm not going to adjust that unless I absolutely have to. So the first thing I'm going to do is take this right down. And we may 
find we're almost out of adjustability. But we, we were there, we got there on the bridge. Um, that's what the stops on the treble side. So we've got, that's a bit under. I don't know, that's one, just on one, and 1.2. So if that was what we imagined, I haven't got a guitar to tune against, that's what we imagine we wanted as the ballpark figure for our last fret action. Not often you, until you slice your thumb, it's not often you realise just how much you need the pad of your thumb to do things. Well, sort of as expected a little bit. Whoop. Clumsy. I'll pick that up in a minute. Um, as we'd expect. We're getting a little bit of zing, but that's partly because it's so flat as well. There's, there's no relief. no relief um, two things can happen one is it can be almost slightly back bowed here which means notes down here risk choking out um, uh, and also because it's so a combination of flat and low means that any high frets will stand out even more this isn't bad now what we haven't is whether they choke or not. Yeah, there we go. We've got a couple of high frets. That's all I really need to know at this point in time. So for this low action, which an SG, by the way, should be able to carry. Somebody commented on a YouTube video this morning saying, um, you know, interesting video, but I don't know where this guy gets off with this unsubstantiated claim that you can make a guitar like this play with a one millimeter action. Well, funnily enough, with an SG, sometimes you can, and sometimes they, they, when the frets are leveled enough in the factory, they can um, actually come out being able to play at such a low action without any remedial fret work. It's rare, um, but sometimes you also get such precision from good quality Ibanez guitars and things like that. There's some that are really careful in, um, you know, where the quality's really good. Um, so. If there's any kind of guitar that's liable to play with a one millimeter last fret action, um, or one, 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 yeah, down to one millimeter at the low E high, low E last fret, this one guitar would be an SG. Okay. So that's given me a good insight or an understanding of what is possible with this neck. Um, the frets aren't really tall and they look like they may have been leveled before a little bit somewhere, um, which is fine. Um, but from my perspective, there's enough here to do another precision level with my tool, with the um, neck uh, in a fully strung position with the, the strings on. So I, I'm confident that I can eke out or iron out these chokes. Uh, probably the eleventh fret, which is slightly high. Um, I can I can probably free all of those up with the same action. The one thing I also will check now is the first fret action while set at this low. Now, of course, the, anybody with half a brain will notice that the three components, the neck relief or lack of the um, first fret action dictated by the, the depth of the nut slots and the last fret action primarily dictated by the height of the bridge. All of those three things are interdependent. So if you raise that up here, then your first fret action is going to consequently increase. If you bend, if you keep those two the same, but you curve the neck away from the nut and in a curve with more relief, then uh, that action will increase, although 
that will stay fairly much the same and it will get to feel harder to play in the middle. Um, so these three things are completely interdependent. So you have to think about that while you're doing this. There, there, I don't have, see that's very low. I don't have a, a formula that says this is how they interact. There isn't a mathematical formula as such. There might be if somebody clever wanted to make one, but I don't have one. Um, now the, the issue is you just have to be conscious that they do interact or interact or interrelate um, so that if I kick off with a low action down here then I, I can be pretty confident that um, it's going to mean um, you know the action here is going to go down a little bit and as such we can see this now so on this guitar the nut is running um, on the first string it's below 0.25 Uh, and it's quite low on all the other strings, but not quite as low. This is lowest on the two E's actually. So this nut has been anyway cut quite low. And from a feel point of view, it feels okay, but there's a tiny bit of buzz on the open string hit really hard because with a combination of low action, flat neck, this nut is cut just fractionally too too much. Now um, Al's perspective, in fact I can see that somebody's cut the slots on here because they've scraped the headstock with the file. All the little telltale signs which is not not hard to do. You can easily do that. So the question here was do we need to um, do anything with the nut because um, Al's put the nut in himself I think um, and he's fitted in with some pretty tough resin so we might have to work hard to get that out. Um, but the question is, right now that's a little bit too low for my liking. Um, I could possibly replace with a black one, although, uh, where am I going? There's a strap tallies. I could possibly replace it with a black one if I've got one. I think I might just have one kicking around in here. That's a sort of similar material. Um, but again, we'd be working with plastic, basically, which I'm not a great fan of. I think we've got one here that calls itself graphite, and whilst that's supposed to be better suited material. I also find that a little bit difficult to work with in terms of getting the precise first fret action. But it kind of suits the guitar. So in a hitherto not normal move for me, I will look at removing this um, this nut. Although, you know, we started out with the possibility of keeping it. I'm going to sneeze. <coughs> um, yeah, well, we started out with, with a sort of possible intention of keeping it. My setups include a new nut, um, usually bone because it's the, it's the most dependable in terms of cutting a precise first fret action, which is the sort of priority that I'm working to. And I'm less concerned how it looks than that I can get an accurate first low first fret action for it. So um, so in this case, I'm in sort of two minds. Now these black nuts um, don't, don't really get used in my, my workshop, so they're sort of spare, so I can afford to try one out for Owl's guitar to keep that sort of overall colour scheme looking the same. And if I can get it to work, then I will. But failing that, I will jump to a bone replacement, which is much easier to work with. In all of these things, I would actually prefer, from experience now that I've um, gained over the time, I don't really want a rounded one, I'd go with a flat topped one. Um, excuse me, experience over time is I'm more and more using adjustable tusk uh, inserts here, which, which were actually designed for the, for the fen fender, for the Gibson Les Paul by Graf Tech. Um, now the thing about this just, just now, um, you do need to change the nut, um, but it's not critical to do that. I could go on and do the fret levelling first, um, and then uh, get that bit out of the way, and then once we take the strings off, I can knock the nut off and we could... But the only downside about that is... Why would we bother? Now it, it doesn't really save any time. I would still need the... I would still prefer the sacrificial strings to be in place so that we could use them as a means of... Um, 
getting the nut slots right. So let me just check this neck relief again. I mean, there is some there. It is not flat, so we're not in a back bow situation. It's, it, an SG neck is, because it's flexible and it's usually got a nice flat 12 inch radius, it, it's both great for big bends and very low actions, um, and it can sustain a very flat neck as well if the frets are level. And for, for a lot of folks, a really fast playing SG tends to be what they're after, whereas Al had a high action SG. So, the thing is, I'm going to go the sort of conventional way I would go. I'm going to just lose these strings for a minute and have a go at taking the nut off. Now, we already know that this is probably glued in with something quite, quite sticky. Um, and it might take a bit of force to get it out. And so we have to be conscious of what, what it's around it. You know, if we, this is really glued very strongly to the, un, to the end of the fingerboard, for example, are we going to take out chunks? Somebody's already taken out some rosewood here and taking a previous one off. Are we going to take out a load more? Um, is it going to take any of this with it? Will it take some of the, the kind of plain mahogany, if you like, from the, uh, the base of the slot, slot? All of those are likely to happen. So, for example, you can see some rosewood stuck to the bottom of there where it's just pulled it straight out because it's been glued in. The other thing that um, is possibly worth doing here, although it's not actually quite, it's not that easy to do in terms of precision, is one of the things that helps is to, the one, one of the reasons I like to use the adjustable uh, inserts, which I haven't got one kicking about here at the moment, I've got them all on guitars at the moment. The reason I like to use an adjustable insert, which gives me the ability to wind this thing up and down and set the exact first fret action, is because it allows me to leave the original factory um, slots untouched. And to be honest, no matter how you do it with all your little files that I've got and whatnot, these will always be smoother running by and large. As long as they're not too small, they will always tend to be better cut because they're machine cut and better than I can do it. Now, as a result, it, it, to, to be able to work with the existing slots is much better than cutting into these, especially if we're dealing with graphite style plastic, which gets very spongy and cuts very unreliably. Equally, this cuts better, um, but it's very easy for this to become wiggly at a microscopic level and grip the strings, and we have to spend quite a lot of time with sandpaper and blades getting that opened out. Even while, by the way, even though I use oversized slots, um, oversized uh, files to, to cut. Actually, these won't be too oversized for this gauge of strings, they'll be about right, but it, that will make it even more likely that we're going to need to widen those to get things running smoothly. Because the running smoothly is absolutely critical, along with the first fret action, that's really important, but the smooth running of the strings is critical. Now, if this had been uh, not already too, just marginally too low, I would have carried on cutting this down and work with what we've got, rather than shoving something similar in or changing it out for a bone one. However, um, we don't have that luxury, so we're going to need to do something to it. Now, one of the things I'd like to do is to know kind of what we're dealing with. Height from top, this is very inaccurate by the way, first thing, about two millimeters. Um, we are from the top of this to top of this body of this to the fingerboard. Now, I wonder what it would take to translate that into this so we can take try and take as much as much as possible from the base of it before we put it into the slot assuming we can even get this other one out which is we're hoping we can so we could do some careful measuring and a bit of drawing he's got no space on his wall but he's got some new pens so i'm just you won't see this exactly but if i draw this what we're looking at right we've got the rosewood da -da, and we've got the nut like that, thing like that, like that. So I can get close to the dimensions, see what we're dealing with. So we have got, actually it's very difficult to see, but we have got approximately 7.4, let's call it 7.5 from, uh, do I go? The front 
7.5 to the front all in, which means the fingerboard width is 5, which is not surprising. Probably actually fractionally less than that. Just on 5, we kind of expect that, quite standard. And so if we're starting out with a, we've got 8.4 here, okay, so our new replacement, if I draw it up here, is 8.4, and let's do, a, let's do the back end, let's do them both sides, they should be the same, but they often do vary. So, 6.8 at the back, it's not very accurate because it rounds over, so you're kind of guessing a bit. And then on this side, just to kind of, this is buried in some goo, so we can't really tell where it starts and finishes, but we'll do our best. Go to the bottom of the slot if we have to clean it out some more. 7.6 on the far side, 7.6, which is about the same. So it's e all I'm trying to ascertain is that it's e evil, even all the way across. And that's rounded, but we'll say it's the same on the other side. We'll call it 6.5. We'll call it 6.5, both sides. Right, and now our measurements are, this is a bit easier to measure because it's squared off. 6.8, actually, as we, expected and ah, it's a bit smaller on the treble end 5.5 so the danger is if we just put this in straight in replacement there the danger is we might end up with it sitting too low but these have been adjusted so that doesn't give us a very clear look either so, if we want to avoid, as, I'm trying to avoid as much downward cutting as possible, but I don't want to overcut it because then we've just wasted the nut, which is not what, what we want to do, even though it's a spare one. So let's go, let's go from the end that we don't want to cut. Um, we know we've got seven at the front and about. Hard to tell really. Seven at the front, six at the back. Seven at the front on this side. So that means it drops down half a millimeter from base to treble on this. And so our height above fingerboard at this end is two. Height above fingerboard in the middle is 2.5, height above fingerboard at this end is 2.2, so about the same, okay, 2.2, so the point is, if we go right down to the bottom of this slot, we know that the gap is 5, well it's actually a bit less on that end, isn't it, what I'm trying to get across is if we drop this in right now, this is just about only just going to be tall enough which is a downside of doing a direct replacement depending on what we have to take out once this thing's come out um, so that's that using that nut which is pre-cut to is pre chamfered downwards um, that is only just going to fit in well we don't know what we're dealing with until we've removed this previous one so here we go we know we're going to run the risk of chipping some wood. So a feel. That is pretty. Oh no, it's not too bad actually. There you go. Help it off. It's a bit a bit sticking on the front here, so let's just carry on rotating it around until it breaks the bond. That's got some paper. Of course, yes, I forgot this bit. So I guess Al had the same problem, so he's put some paper underneath underneath this nut as well. Or well, somebody had. Um, to lift it up. So really we don't want that in there either. So we've got quite a bit of gunge at the front of this, front edge of this. So we do want to get rid of some of that as much as is possible. Now if we do need to shim it for this particular kind of nut, then we will consider what we're going to use from scratch. But that's if we desperately need to lift this up. <laughs> you can see all that gunge coming out paper. Don't want to chop the strings if we can help it. 
So just uh, that that needs a bit of cleaning out still. But let's just drop in our. Um, actually, that's not a million miles off on the trill side. Let's see where it sits. It's a very light groove there anyway. It would be struggling. Okay, so we are at about a little bit, a tiny bit too much. That's not bad. We might want to take a fraction off this base side because that's going to be way, quite a bit too high. Um, I'm just estimating by running the blade parallel to see what my gap is. Um, it needs, actually, it's going to be slightly north of parallel, but at parallel I can get a good idea of the first threat action from there, which is about a millimeter, so 0.7 or 0.8 of a millimeter close to. Anyway, so I think we need to carefully lose about a millimeter off here. And that's going to be very difficult to do and not do the other end. So 8.4 the front edge down to 7.4. Um, 7.4. Let's go to 7.6. 7.6. Again, it's difficult to know where you're measuring from. That's nearly a millimetre. Um, we could, if you wanted to get totally, totally precise, I mean, don't forget we've also got some stuff stuck in the uh, groove here, which might mean this sits even further down when the time's right. Um, but it, it's actually... It's actually sitting there, quite behaving itself quite well now. So let's just for fun, let's just let's just push this on. And another way we could do the calculation is to work out what the gaps are on the first fret as is. So let's put it under some load. This is why it, it's good to be working with old strings at this point, because they don't mind being. Done up, undone, done up again. Okay, looking at the edge here, that is actually sitting perfectly uh, in the groove, except this end isn't. So that's my worry. This end, uh, unless that, excuse me, unless that, is that an actual gap? Or are we just looking at, no, that is an actual gap. So if this were to fit down in that hole, this end would disappear, and it's currently almost exactly where we'd want it. So this, it's too low as is. So this this would just drop into that. I've seen this before. Epiphones are actually now I think about it, I've had this problem every time with Epiphones. So that to me that that does away with working with this graphite nut. I'm afraid because to even make it work, the Epiphones tend to have deeper nut slots than many other Les Paul style guitars or SG styles. So what it means is, and that's why um, Al's had to do this. He's whatever nut he's had he's had to shim it. Um, so we, we want to avoid that, um, but it means that we can't use this graphite thing, okay? So that's out of the question. What we can do is we can go to a bone nut. Now again, this is at present not sitting neatly in that hole, and it's because the, um, it's because, what do I need? I need a piece of paper. It's because the slot is a bit, something not quite right. I just wonder if I can just... I keep, the one thing I keep never buying is those curvy bits of metal that you're supposed to use for separating out the strings from behind here. And this probably isn't going to work because they have to have a bit of spring in them, but it's, it's to, the idea is to come on, <laughs> keep the strings away from the nut slot, like that. Um, yeah, so before we commit to anything, we want to get these surfaces as scraped clean as possible without obviously without cutting any anything unwanted um, troughs but there this has got quite a lot of old gunge on it and it does need a fair bit of movement the problem is it's actually quite quite a difficult thing to do without clamping something down because everything wants to move while you're scraping. So what I'm going to try and get to is a place where first and foremost whatever nut we're going to use sits tidily in that slot. That's the, that's the important start point. Um, you know if you don't get that then <coughs> it could be dropping down at some point. 
So we want to check that this fits, and then we'll do our best to get the height of it right from that point on. See, I don't like this. <laughs> height right, so that's still too narrow. Now, I could uh, thin this down a bit, but it fits at this end, but not the other end. So it's a bit of a shame to have to thin the nut down to fit it. But in a sense, if the alternative is we have to cut into the cut further into the paintwork on this guitar, that's not desirable either. What I do notice is that we have quite a lot of built up glue at this end, which we can still remove. And that might just be the difference between it fitting in the slot and not. Yeah, that's almost there. In fact, I'd rather it had that tiny little gap than to um, cut, rather than shimming or thinning down the nut, actually. Um, so it's just a, a very careful clean, cleaning operation. Mm. It's very it's actually quite tricky to get a square edge in to clean the face of this bit here by the headstock paint. Right, so we get all of that done, and I think this is very much nearly. Done. It's a bit of an overhang on this one, so we'll need to. Um, I'll need to prepare to chisel off or sand, sand off the excess at the other end. So when it flush at one end, we'll check it. And now while we're at it, we could use the strings to hold it down at this point and have a, just have a, <coughs> a default look. Now it would be wonderful if we just. Put these strings on and everything is at pretty much the correct height because that would make the job so much easier but i suspect that isn't going to be the case so if you've got the position right tighten up the center pair first and the outer ones that is pretty much not far off actually you could be lucky I would like it to be the case. Now I don't know anything about the tuning at the moment. I'm just hoping to keep the nut in one place. That looks good to me. It's actually repositioned the, just slightly repositioned. In fact, I've done a good job on repositioning the, um, the, fr the strings down the fingerboard. That's nearly solved that problem. Um, so I like the way that's sitting. Now the question is, is what's happening? I <laughs> see even at this end that's just almost on the deck. All right. All right. So I think we might be looking at the fact that any uh, nut for an Epiphone has to be an Epiphone brand one. first fret. So that's tasty, but uh, that's too close to the first fret. That's really funny. So yeah, basically that slot is no, not going to work. So we're sort of now we're, we're kind of starting to run out of options um, other than finding ourselves an actual correct height Epiphone nut, which which is bleeding annoying, and it probably means we're going to have to revert to this one, which uh, often is you I'd more likely use as an acoustic guitar one. Um, this works fine. Um, it's probably going to be our only hope to get that bit of height back. It's annoying, but that's. Uh, I should have it flagged up in my mind, Epiphone, always taller than any other nut you care to use. Most of these generic nuts that I have, excuse the expression, will work for most Les Paul style guitars with a little bit of um, 
removal of excess off the edge or sanding filing dremeling back but in this case that bog standard nut is that slot is too deep for that so we now have to revert in desperation to one more again similar sort of width issue so we're going to line it up and all I'm looking for now is fingers crossed that this thing will not be on the on the deck on the frets just to begin with now it's not actually that hard to shim um, at all I could have shimmed any of those nuts with a plastic uh, insert of some kind I've got white plastic that would do it and in fact I've often um, done it with plastic glue to the bottom of a white nut and it looks fine you, you can't even tell the join but in fact I've probably got some in my spares thing already made up but I'm looking to see if I can do it with a new nut now this one is very good but now we're miles taller um, let me just see in my spares whether we actually do have a ready shimmed one as a single glued unit because in a way that would make this a lot easier sorry bit of a mess well there's one look that's pre pre shimmed might be worth keeping that out um, so it's just somewhere where I've glued a piece of plastic to bone already and raised the height for that purpose because this one fits or it's, it's, a, it's high enough but actually that's going to require quite a bit of taking it down because now it's quite a lot too high for the purpose but we've got to start from higher but ideally not so much higher um, because we could be uh, yeah we could be taking but I couldn't I could I could work out fairly accurately how much we need to take off let's do that in a second if we kept this one so the way to do it it's a bit fiddly I suppose is to use your finger gauge feeler gauge and find out what the gap here is and I wish I had a digital one for this purpose because this is a big handful of parts that I can no longer read what the hell they are. 0 0.6, 0 0.4, let's go to one. Now let's go to one, two, five. One, two, five, okay, can I get them out? All right, one, two, five, 1.25 millimeters. That's probably gonna to be too much, but let's start with that. Yep, okay, let's go to one millimeter. Now it's, it's good if we can know, then we know how much to take down if we need to use this one. Right, I'm going to call that one. So we know how much on that side, and that's too high on that, there's too much there. Let's go to six. It's actually probably close to seven but let's be conservative and call it six was that the other way around no conservative will overestimate it we'll call this one one which means we have to take away what do we want minus 0 0.6 from that edge and this other side is what did we say it was six 0.6 and we want to take away 0 0.2 assuming that it's sitting low down yes it is okay so we know that that's the spec for this nut and it's it's going to be very difficult to take off that much accurately if we can't mark a line or anything we're going to have to just do it by a little bit of working and rechecking and we get close so let's just quick this off for a minute and say we can we can kick off with that if necessary now what else have i got here to play with right this is the is this the other shimmed one yes it is you wouldn't even be able to tell. It actually might even be a bone stuck to bone, hence it's practically invisible. So you can see how much fiddling there is already to get a new nut. If you just stick a new nut on, let's put that one there because we know that relates to those specs. Let's go those out of the way because they're not involved. Let's start with this one here. This is a kind of an unbleached bone looking thing. So I'm feeling this might be too low for starters. Uh, we'll see. Um, yeah, so you can see that if you just were in the factory game of chucking a, chucking a nut onto here and run for the hills, um, then 
you wouldn't worry about this stuff, but you would actually also get a very um, bad first fret action. And we're not after that. <laughs> all the same note. Okay, so this one is it's sort of a more vintagey look, but it's already been cut and shaped in the past, um, so it would need a bit more cutting and shaping too. But there is enough to work with that one to work down. Um, well, I'm not so keen on the positioning on that one, I have to say. It sends us a bit off the mark, whereas the sort of acoustic looking one that I chose actually has the positioning. Actually, you know what? It's exactly the same. Uh, that's funny. So which one, which one had the best positioning? No, they're not all the same. How weird. This one had, I think, a tiny bit more space, hence I went a bit further this way. So that's kind of where I went. But this one, to fit flush, has to start there. Which gives us a little bit... Hmm. I think I'm going to work with the new one. Well, the, the unshimmed one. Because they're, they're both tall. And I'm going to try and take... I can do a combination of downward cutting and upward. Or upward first and then downward. And this is based, as we know, on the string. Um, yeah, that's based on the string height. So, this is the fun part now. We get our thing, what is it called? Turn that off. We get our sandpapery thing. It's getting warm now. Hopefully, the screen Stroke Summer's coming back now. This is, oh look, I've inherited a, a little curved strap nut as well somehow. Okay, so this is the, the fun bit. I know why, I'm wearing a thermal t-shirt because I'm cold. It was cold. So on this one, we want to lose 0.6 from this side and 0.2 from the other side. So hardly any, it's going to be quite tricky to do. So we're taking the reading from anywhere we want really, as long as it's the same place every time. Let's do it in the slot, so at least we have a reference point. So, what we know, that is 8.2, and we want this to go down to uh, 7.6. Right, that's just a reference point on the caliper. So I'm going to write it here, 7.6. And this one, to lose 0.2, is going to go from... Kind of, Hardly possible we can get that in the slot. Caractivus pots. Okay. Go from 8.1 down to 7.9 on the meter. That's interesting. That shouldn't be the case, really. So that's how inaccurate this measuring part is, because this really doesn't sit in that groove properly. The caliper isn't thin enough. So we're probably best off running from the top edge here, in this case. So we're going from 8.2 to 8. I don't really care. 8.2 to 8. And actually those are only reference points, so we don't care that they don't look the same, those numbers. Right, so... I'm going to put this one, we're doing this one inside the groove, and we want to go to 7.6. We're going from 8.4, that's stable, down to 7.6, which is fractions of a millimetre, as you can see. Can't seem to get it to um, 7.6, 7.5, 7.6, right. So, here we go. And we want to keep a square bottom. So which end am I going to put the, put the push on, this end here? So let's help ourselves along the way with some, some marker pencil so we can see what we're doing. Soft pencil. It's going to help us, help guide us. So 
So base end, we want to take off 0.6. Yeah. And pushing down on the base end alone. So we barely, just barely touching the treble end. And right now we'll have gone to well, we want to go to 7.6 or an 8.1. So we're coming down a tiny bit. And again, I'm going to mark this up because I constantly want to be hardly touching that treble end. But I want it to do it as a straight slope, barely touching the top end. So we might need to put some pressure on the top end there. So the top end still reading at 8.4. And we need to go to 8. Uh, let's see, that's a different size. 8.4. 8.3. We haven't done any, so it's 8.3. Go to 8.1. Let's just be on the safe side. 8.1. Uh, so, mark it up again. And we wanted to get to 7.6 on this measurement here. 7.8, we're heading there. Now I'm going to spread the load a bit all the way along. So when we get to, point being is when we get to this point at which the same amount has to come off each side, we can then treat it as a single flat piece, um, which isn't perfect science, but hey. So 7.6 there, we're on the mark for that one. And then we wanted 8.1 on this side here, which is hard to get to. We're on 8.2. So I'm now going to just, on the smoothest, uh, finer stuff, I'm just going to do a little bit of a push on this top end. And that should be the works. We want to get to 8.1. 8.1, we're there. Hello, Morris. Perfect timing, Mr. Precision. Would you, um, would you check my, would you check my measurements, Morris? Is that correct? Yes? Touch my nose with your nose if it is. Thank you. Tells me the truth, this boy. Right, so let's get, let's get, let's get the guitar back up and ready. Let's put these back up in here in their, their new place. I should chuck all the other ones away since I've got new ones. And the other ones are just clogging up the space. Right, boy, here comes the guitar, which is going to Minimize your playing space. Excuse me. Oh, here comes a ball. Should we go and get the ball? Should we go and get the ball? Stay down and talk to the counter. Please try faux fun. Did I say, hear the sound of somebody's ball? Wait on time. Be he alive or be he dead. in dust. Down again. Thank you. Right. It's returning a football to a neighbour. Okay, so now we have specially lowered bits and bobs. Now, I guess while we're at it, let's drop this again. I would love to be able to get this so that we don't do any downward cutting. That would be the ideal situation. I've never been successful in that before, but actually I've never done it with the feeler gauge like this before. Strange. That may sound. I have not. I have not. You see, you, you try, you try, but it never works. Damn it. <laughs> now let's just check the, the hole it's in. See, we can drop that a bit further back in because it doesn't sit absolutely perfectly. We're kind of near, but we're still a bit over. So if we just check where, how far over we are. No, you see, we're, we're actually, we're close to the point four. This, isn't, this has worked out fairly well, actually. Point four, yeah, actually, that's not bad. That's a little higher. Well, you know what? 
You see, what you also get, by the way, is you get the, the, the radius cut slightly differently, so we, we still probably, it's rare to get one that's spot on, so we probably have to do a little bit, tiny bit of downward cutting, but this has minimized it, and I'm happy with that. Right, so I will now do that final bit of downward cutting. So I do need my, whatchamacallit, my metric thingy, and we're gonna go with a 0.4 as a conservative, don't, don't cook it too fine option. And we do need the, um, the tune to be reasonable, close to. interesting because that edge is looking just, just slightly proud um, I'm gonna just what it's doing out there I'm just gonna check the straightness of this bottom edge before I commit to any more of this um, what I'm gonna do also, just going to very slightly make sure this is narrowed down just enough to fit perfectly in that slot and without any sitting out. Now I'm feeling a bit of any rock and roll going on in there. Let's take a straight edge and check it for a light gap. Now that owed me a tiny bit of unevenness. Let's get rid of that. Now we were a bit tall on the base side still won't we so let's just flatten that out with a focus on the base side we're right close to the finish mark with this right now straight edge better um, okay well it's been fun doing this a little bit more accurately than I might have done it in the past um, just with the intention of avoiding having to cut down at all but what I don't want to find is that now it's sat a little bit more perfectly in place and that we end up having to um, shim it again this is how if you try to avoid the down cutting this is this is what can happen So we're pretty much on there. That's good. Like it. later we need to position it and, and just sand off the uh, little overhang on this side it's a very slight but that's good otherwise in good shape um, and like I say if, if we wanted to adjust the middle ones down a little bit they are a little bit higher than the outside ones these two we can do that tiny tweak but it's the, just getting away doing the minimal amount of tweaking that we have to do. Now the next bit is to, high for fret leveling, is to uh, give all of these strings a markup with marker pen. And I'm doing it this way because I can't be bothered to take all the strings off and then lose the nut and have to put it all in once all again. So I'm sort of doing halves at one go. Um, it doesn't matter by the way if I get pen on the strings because they're only sacrificial okay so these are a bit harder to do 
that's it. Just like I say, just trying to avoid having to um, lose the nut and refit it. So then we can go all the way across. And this is my this pen is my guide. This pen is my guide. As this pen is my guide, and this is going to be telling me where the fret leveling is happening. And come along. It's a very simple way to do it. Ta -da. So you can see that just getting a more a better cut, more suitable nut rhymes for this guitar has taken Taking a while, um, but it's worth it. Um, this is, this has got quite a crack in it. This body, and that's the downside of these SGs. Again, that's one of their design flaws. Um, if they, if you see, uh, you quite often find a crack there, emanating out across and out from the jack socket. This thing has a load of levering force attached to it, obviously because the socket sits out and gets pulled either which way even when you're being as gentle with it as possible it gets pulled around and as a result um, it, it does that because it's a very thin piece of wood on most guitars it's a thin piece of wood it has to be for you to get the pots through unless you've got long thicker wood stronger wood you have to have longer pots excuse me cost more money for Chinese manufacturer um, so you know the budgetary constraints means they use smaller pots thinner wood and so on and so on um, shorter pots and thinner wood and as a result you add in all that leverage levering force and the thing is going to break and it does and there's no real way of fixing it other than um, well wow. <laughs> other than you um, uh, put a plate in there behind it and, and resin it in so it can't spread any further now this is practically flat almost completely flat so there's virtually nothing I can do with this I can't put any bend in it at all and it's ready to use which is fine so what I'll do is I'll spread the strings away and we'll get straight on to the, the first track which I call the, the E track because it's where the E string lives um, now I'm just gonna have a quick sort of diagnostic peek what I'm seeing is some cutting up here where I kind of expected find some but none in the middle so I think we probably need to recalibrate that and add a tiny bit of curvature to it because it's very close it's just fractionally not um, it's not following the curve precisely so when you ever, if you ever get that cutting pattern um, now I can see that it needs a little bit more bend if you ever get that cutting pattern stop and recalibrate if you're using this method it's very easy to do Sit. Oh, right, that's not sitting on the string. Sit between the strings. Okay, that's about right. It's actually a fraction curved, if anything, but that's not a, too much of a problem. It's very close. It's better to be a tiny bit curved than to not be curved at all and miss the middle frets. But Looking at this, it's, it's showing up pretty quickly actually that the, the, there are some high frets on here which are some clustered near the nut end and a few more clustered at the top end and they're quite noticeable. Um, what we'll do at this point is we'll not to take too much but we'll stop and play the notes and just make sure they're all playing and then we'll move on. You see that's got a buzz on the first fret and it could be that this is actually no it's still got relief but it is telling us that that it's telling us we actually have it's not that common but we have two frets here that are actually high now it has very little one way of getting rid of that quickly would be to add more neck relief but this guitar has some neck relief in it and it's enough that it should play 
anything other than just dead flat it should play and the fact that it's choking here is telling us that either this first fret is too low um, or the second fret is high and I think we have to trust trust the machinery it's telling us the second and third frets are too high so I'm going to concentrate on alleviating that you see it's very very tiny amount of clearance we're talking here for this to, to work properly yeah you know, the, the point is at any point like all of these things we can solve all this just by cracking the action up and calling it quits right and that's the sort of giving in that's quite that's that's really high that one um it's the giving in method right we, we're just saying look we, we're going to just bump the action up until there's no more problem. Tiny bit more needed there. So there is a problem down that end compared to the first fret, which is not getting touched at all. Um, so just one of those things you pick up. Now, this could be because it's of the way it's been perhaps leveled in the past um, with a technique that hasn't done it as, accurate, as accurately as it should. But this is this is quite distinctive um, like I said solve it immediately by raising the uh, or increasing the neck relief but all you do there is you, you cure that problem but you're creating more playing action in the middle Also know that I'm going to put a slightly stronger um, set of strings, strong strings, heavier gauge strings on here uh, later on, which will add probably add a little extra bit of relief into here. And again, that's okay by me because it is dead on flat at the moment, which is probably a little bit too much, too much flat than flatter than it needs to be. But having said that, we don't want to um, end up. I don't want an SG to end up with a big relief curve in it. You might say better on an acoustic where the strings are going to flap around a lot because you're going to hit them hard to make noise and make the thing actually play. Um, but with this, we, we want a, we're looking for a, a, a low light guitar that you can play good rhythm stuff on, but also fast lead guitar if that's your thing. Okay, so we're getting some. That one is a real problem. These two, in fact, are the big problem on this guitar. I thought it was 11. 11 is cutting up pretty deeply, but it's not as big a problem as these two. See, now we're still choking out bending the E, but that's because we're bending across into the G track. So I'm going to now move across to the G track and um, get rid of that hump on the 11th fret that's choking out that bend or that intended bend. Now we can put a bit more curvature in at this point. The radius, uh, the, the curvature of the neck, the relief does change across as you move across the radius, believe it or not. Um, not a huge amount, but it has little variations. That's why this method is so good because you can you can recalibrate each time you move to a different track. So now we're going to do this G. Now, you heard a second ago that that B, sorry, that E string was choking out in the middle, in bends up by the 11th fret. And this part of it now is designed, this is right now is where we're going to iron out that choking spot to free up that, those bends and any others, basically. So, I'm going to aerobics for the day. Okay. Okay, now let's try the open or the clean notes first. Good. Now try the bends. Now, that's choking out because we're bending across into the high 
or into the area of the D string, which is fine. We'll just now take that down as well. But that's cleared up the choking spot on the G track, so it's working. Um, now let's try to recalibrate for that's fine for the D track, and this should then clear up that last bit of the bend. And anyone who could bend any further than that deserves a medal. Again, two and three are cutting quite substantially. You've got low spot around five and six. And we're expecting 11, 12 to cut. Particularly, yeah, there they are, 11 and 12 cutting, and 13 and 14 for that matter. So now. over into the into the A zone okay and we've also don't forget got we've set an incredibly low um, low height uh, string height as well I've set one millimeter on the high E which is which is extremely challenging you know we we could raise that a time my target action is normally 1.2 so we've got a little bit of leeway to put that back up if we get to a point where we can't get that final zing out of the high bends. Um, at 1.2 is still a very low action, uh, as anyone will tell you. But I like to set the highest possible challenge that I know that SGs can do, typically. But not all SGs, sometimes the neck just won't do it. And it particularly if the radius is maybe a little bit fraction tighter than somebody else's 12 inch radius. These things aren't always exactly the same. Like clothes sizes in the shops in town kind of thing. So. Do one more bit in the G track and then we'll be uh, nearly there. I'll just recalibrate for the G. But again, like I say, very low action, all going splendidly well at the moment. Now get it into the G. So you can see this is a not quick process either, even with an old guitar like this. But what we're doing is we're making it possible to play at its up, you know, its absolute lowest possible action. Now, of course, if you prefer something else, you can step back up from that. But here we are aiming for its best possible, lowest possible action without any chokes. Okay, it'll do me. Uh, at one millimeter on the high E at the last fret. So a lot of people measure it at the 12th fret, um, which means it gets usually gets bigger. And so a lot of people go for 1.5 at the 12th fret. I'm going for one at the last fret, which means by the time you get up there, the, let's see, it's even lower at the 12th fret. Now that, that isn't strictly true if it's got a lot of relief in it. That means the 12th fret can be, can be somewhat a little bit higher than the last fret if you've got loads of relief, but typically it's, it continues to increase. So, um, sorry, if you've got it at one millimeter at the last fret, then it's going to be very low. It's going to be even lower at the twelfth if you don't have a lot of relief. Hmm, nicely in tune. Fab. 
yep, low and lovely. You can tell, it takes quite a bit of filth to get there. Right, I'm happy with that. Um, we know that we're going to put we're going to put the strings on um, higher gauge, heavier gauge strings, so we will get a little bit more uh, relief in the neck than we've currently got. A fraction more, that's fine. We can dial that out if we don't want it. Just going to check the um, switch. switch just just we sprayed it used it a few times and it works fine right okay so we've got the nut we're getting the nut where we want it I'm gonna glue it first and then we'll cut the edge down manually afterwards so to get it get it in place we're gonna have to take it off again I'm gonna use the strings as the glue and hey, welcome back strings off some of the dust just wiped off to begin with. Um, nut glued in place. Um, what I'm going to do right now is remark up the what's it again frets, and this time so we can um, reprofile them. And make sure that any flat spots now are re-rounded off but in such a way that they're rounded off without taking down the um, overall height of the fret because that would be pointless since we've just spent a good hard hard earned time making sure that they are level okay so the old stew mac file very handy for this you can see as i'm doing this it leaves behind traces of the any um, fret grooves and because the frets on this are not new by any standards um, removing those grooves are not a priority so in leveling if they come out that's a bonus or if the leveling reduces them somewhat that's a bonus but there's no way for my old grooving I'm, I'm gonna pay in fret metal it's too marginal on a guitar like this um, so that's the sort of rationale behind it. And also because the slightly slight depressions and notches here actually don't interfere with play. Um, they never get, rarely get so deep that they actually, they're not like notches that develop on a zero fret, for example, which actually do interfere with play. Um, those cowboy chords fretware just, they're just visible, cosmetic really. Um, so, as I say, they're only ever removed as a secondary benefit, or if you know if somebody's really bugged by how they look. But I never go after removing those. I don't think it's a fair trade in exchange for fret metal. As simple as that. Now we're in a good spot now. We are coming close to. God, my thumb is still sore. We are at the point where we can do a variety of things. We can. We can do anything we like with the, by the way, with the bridge because when we put this back on, we can set the action wherever we want. So I can take this right off for the time being, um, and take these out as well. And it's absolutely fine that when I come to restring it, I can then just dial the chosen low action back in, and we know that the frets will be capable of playing with that action. That's a nice thing. Now at this point in time, I'm going to get some solvent naphtha onto the grubbier parts of this pit guard and the body just to get rid of some of this ground on dirt so we can it's, it's actually it's amazing it's been so dirty for so long i don't know if you can see this it's been so dirty for so long that the dirt has protected the um, paintwork so you've got a darker paintwork here and two light strips well the dirt and the bridge obviously but you know, it's a combination of both, but it has helped that there's dirt under there for a long time. So, this is a, it makes it look grubby for the time being because we're sort of 
spreading a bit of grime around but it gets lifts up the worst of it and then we can sort of give it a polish out afterwards and it was just slightly tricky uh, we've got a loose jack socket there we've got to take care of hmm and that is that's not good um that is split you see so it's never going to want to stay closed uh, it's never going to want to stay tight um, we can put some more pressure on it and hold it for a while but um, it'll do it's just one of the things you've got to short of replacing it all together you've just got to keep an eye on that um, keep on gently tightening it up and never over tighten it as well because you've got that crack there which is not going to help things along so just giving everything a bit of a clean over it's it's a nice colour, this thing, I like that. We're just giving it as much of a clean up as we can in the short term. Now also we're going to remove and switch these pickups out. We'll get some, we'll probably get under the under this pick guard and get some of that grime gone too. Because um, I like to be able to give everything a, a clean up as we go. Um, sometimes when the, it's a really grubby headstock, it's nice to take the pick, pickups, pickups, the tuners off. This is actually not that bad a condition so doesn't really need it um, and get in and out of these quite easily but some it's really difficult to do and you've got ground in dirt um, the next thing on this sort of requirement really is to get a bit of naphtha on the frets themselves and rub off that uh, DNA stuff it doesn't always all come off in one go so it does take a bit of effort. This has an added bonus so while you're at it of removing the, the marker pen that we just put on there to um, check the uh, both the levelling of the frets and the reprofiling of them. But we can get rid of that as we go up and down. This is this will get rid of a lot of the DNA goo. And of course once we've done all of this um, then we have to polish out those frets in a hand polishing process using a variety of different grades. I won't show that on this video. Some people get the myth that I don't, but it's just it's a bit dreary, half an hour of aerobic exercise and noise, really. And all I need to tell you really is if you do it by feel, and I use three grades of paper to begin with, which is 600, 1000, and 1500. Once I've, I do two pieces each of those using a, mostly a, a foam pad. Once I've finished that, I switch to a micro mesh polishing set, which itself runs from about 1500 through to 12,000 grit. Uh, even this, it doesn't quite remove, well, it doesn't remove the sort of impressions of people's fingers, although the goo is gone. That's a BB King song, isn't it? The goo is gone. Um, so you get a filthy rag that can go in the bin. Right, now, having done all of that, I think, great, we're, we could restring this and get playing. Except, we're in the market for some new pickups, remember? So, I think we better get ourselves ready for that bit, and I'll reposition you. Um, so you can see what's going on. Actually, I'd never I could have. No, they'll change the pickups first. Um, could have done that after the polishing, but it's fine. Now, I'm not sure if my soldering iron. going to work. It was a bit funny the other day, but we shall see. Okay, so this should give us a plate just to lift out. This has got nice, it's got, um, what the word might be we're looking for, shielded cavities. Um, so I should perhaps have left one screw in. One screw in, yeah, let's just do that in a minute while I'm here. I don't want it dropping out. We can give it a clean under there as well. 
just leave one or two screws in just so that I can flip it over and unhook the pickups. Now, where are they and where do they connect to? So, pickups come in one of two colours. They come in as the red one here or the yellow one there. It's not very imaginative colour scheme. I'd better get the, um, the other viewing thing, camera stand. Mm. Look at all that goo when using the naphtha. It's just, it's just off and run off. Run off? Mm. Right, here we have the soldering iron thing. Sorry about the noise. Protect your ears. Protect your ears. Then you can come around here and go like that. We say, right, we are. Velcroed somewhere in the vicinity of the soldering department, something like that. So we've also got to cut these back because we're going to re-drill those and we've got a new hole to drill in there when we come to put the cover back on. So first thing we're going to do is where do the pickups come in? Well they come in first and foremost, if you don't even understand, well, if you don't understand this you have to figure it out. So they come in from here, so there's the thing coming in and you can see that they go in to the pot on lug number one and I'm going to snip that on lug number one and I'm going to snip the ground lump there and then the other pickup comes in this will be the bridge pickup comes in goes to ground there and I'm going to just cut it here for a minute it goes to the first lug there so that's the pickups current pickups disconnected um, we're going to take these two screws out we'll lift out the whole Right, put it to one side for a sec. Uh -huh, I got it right. You can see out comes that. And you can see the difference in colour of the um, you bits of leftover wood. Get that little bit of a, a scrub round only because it can. There's no real need because it's going to go back under the pickup. Pickup could pick up. But I like to clean it anyway because I'm like that. Why not get rid of any old goo that's built up? People's hairs and strange things that get stuck under there. It's very odd. Get around the base of those posts as well. There's a lot of muck in a guitar. For a second because at the moment we don't need it just for a second now i've immediately forgotten which pickups are going in this one so i'm going to go in the house stop this and find out hold on because i put it on my whiteboardy thing hold on a sec righty ho look sorry it's not really sticky this velcro isn't really here we have <clears throat> the new and the old it's got 59 bridge 59 neck mm -hmm. and old two wired jobbies so we're going to need to do some things here first thing we're going to do is take these out now the, the ones here have come uh, the new ones have come supplied with pickup rings but we don't need those so let's just get a, 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 a box for all the leftover bits we're going to have that we don't need. Because um, we're going to put those rings in there as well. Because these are designed, well, this pickup, this pickup, this pick guard likes to hang pickups from them, if you get what I mean. Bit of an old, thin old thing, this. But We'll still use um, we'll use the 
screws and springs that come with the new ones for these, for hanging them in the same place, because they'll be matched. Clearly designated E. What? That's supposed to be. All right, they're both marked E for Epiphone. Yeah, last one in my hand. Uh, <clears throat> one with more wire. Bridge, wasn't it? You yeah, look at that. It's all bent. Hmm. Bent and not at all shiny, really. Um, let's mark these. Decent pen. Come on. Uh, bridge. Yeah. I've got the same length of wire, that won't make it very really helpful. Let's just double check this, otherwise I'll be running to myself and anyone else in the future. Um, yeah. Those are both red wires, aren't they? Yeah. Well, who knows then, frankly, sorry. Perhaps I shouldn't have taken them apart in such a hurry. It doesn't say, it just says E for Epiphone. They're probably the same pickup twice, actually. That's usually the case with Epiphones like this, budgety things. Okay, so we have this kind of worn, slightly worn pick guard, which is a bit lifty as well, frankly. It's got some anti goo on it from olden times. Um, it's as pretty as it's ever going to look. And it's, hmm, it's buckled up a little bit in the middle, but there's not much we can do about that. Okay, so we're going to go with replacing these. So we go from uh, grey. I'm going to write this down because I, I always forget to do this and I always get caught out and it's always cost me time. So neck is going to be grey. Neck equals grey and bridge equals black on this one. So that's that. Now we're going to undo this first of all. So this is designed with the screw coil facing the front. Probably do with a slightly bigger. Thingy. Find a good one. Yeah, that will do. It could be Max Gear for Music uh, Electroacoustic, new electroacoustic being delivered. Possibly. It's a bit early, but. He, um, he's setting up a, a local jam night near him. And uh, he wanted to get in a couple of guitars for the purpose, so he's um, he's bought one locally, which was a Fender, basic Fender CV, whatever they're called, that I spotted, which was a good price. And uh, um, I recommended him for a very inexpensive new cheap gear for music electroacoustic. Which is um, a real bargain actually price wise. Something like 70 pounds including delivery or very little. Um, and actually, you know, in, re in hindsight, I think I would have recommended him to get two of those. Uh, rather than pointing him at any second hand ones. I think the second hand budget guitar, uh, acoustic guitar market is a bit of a danger zone really. Um, it's just, especially in the UK, which it seems that every guitar that I see is covered in. Um, not covered in. Every guitar I see has absorbed plenty of moisture from the, the English climate, um, and as a result, has a bellied top. No, we're not talking arch tops. We're talking standard flat tops. But yeah, so they don't they don't um, they don't like the English weather very much. The British weather, British climate. Anyway, the 
So I think in future my advice would be actually you'd be better off buying a brand new budget guitar in which the only reason people avoid things like gear for music uh, is the snob value, you know, brand attachment. The gear for music type of production um, you know, is as good as any, pretty much any budget Chinese factory. They very tend to be, or can be very good. I haven't seen bad quality stuff. You know, it's one of those companies that uses a Chinese factory and, and is big enough to make sure the quality stays good, stays high. Um, or should I say, has enough clout to make sure it, the quality stays good. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, if I could, if I could turn back time, I would recommend that he, um, he bought two of those rather than the second-hand Fender. Right, there's our 59s. We know the colour scheme. We're ready to. Oh God, not a lot of room at the moment in this joint. Ready to reattach these, and we've just got to feed the wires successfully through the small holes. It's actually not the easiest thing in the world on this two at once with not much not much dangle room available, hardly any. Um, and lots of projections for these wires to catch on along the way so they don't go through like this. So a simple thing to do is to get some tape and bunch them off together into a little wrapped up twist to say you have to stand a bit of chance of getting them through in one piece stopping them catching on stuff and then once we've done that we'll get them in we'll nail down this I can't even hold it <laughs> we'll nail this down and then we'll begin the process of hooking up Through you go, please. Obviously, one of these has got to, the grey one has got to go through the middle. Um, through the middle comfortably, that's about right. And the black one has to get this side of that thing, sort of over there. And we'll get the tug through there to where they're comfy. <laughs> he said, not having got it right. Okay, that's why it's buckling, because the way that hole is positioned, this is almost inevitably going to pull upwards a little bit when it's there. Right, that's fine. Let's put these back in. Let's make sure we're at minimum torque, which you always want to be doing when you're dealing with pit guards and stuff. Wrong head. Um, I had a, 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 a really annoying thing this morning. We were in town, and... Um, we're down by the river, which in Tavistock is absolutely beautiful. We are blessed with the gorgeous country Devonshire, um, Dartmoor, <clears throat> fast running river that goes through our town. So it's a, it's a beautiful place. And when the spring, summer comes, the trees are you know, running right through the middle of town. The river, and the trees are just majestic. And there's so much greenery and the sound of water. and wild animals and even salmon sometime in the air um, I've seen in that river it's got a great weir um, which keeps the water really oxygenated anyway it's a place it's a very special place for us and we love to go there and we were down there today and just did some post office -y things and then a quick walk by the river and as we were walking along I saw a, a guy well dressed older chap sitting on a bench and um, he was, uh, he had a, you know, well, you know, good clothes. He wasn't, he wasn't some sort of, I don't know, unkempt looking, a tidy looking chap. And uh, he had a pair of binoculars around his neck, which made me think, oh, look, he's, you know, he's a, a wildlife lover. And uh, he was sitting there on his own with his cagoule and whatnot, having, having a, ice cream lolly thing, you know, um, magnum type thing, one of those big ice creamy chocolate covered things. Anyway, 
So he was, uh, he was sitting there eating that, and we walked past, and I kind of looked back as we were standing by the river, and I saw him get up, and I thought, oh, okay, he's, he's off. And then, um, <clears throat> and then I saw him kind of turn his back towards the wall, um, and you could see he was looking for a crack to push this wooden ice cream lollipop stick into the crack, and I'm thinking, why is he doing that? It's the kind of thing that I might have done when I was a kid or something. And um, anyway, it's just, I sort of kind of surreptitiously watched him. And because he was, because I, I kind of <clears throat> made up my mind that he was a, with his binoculars, he was a nature lover. I thought, oh, okay, maybe what he's doing is he's going to, he's going to leave that there because it's a bit sticky with ice cream. And uh, he's going to take his photographs and then, of course, he's going to come back and pick it up so he can dispose of it correctly, I thought. Anyway, so I kind of kept my eye on him, and I could see that on the bench there was also um, the whole kind of tin foil, you know, the metal foil um, ice cream wrapper as well, that he'd left, or he, he was, he'd left, yeah, wedged between two slats of the seat. I was thinking to myself, oh, okay, and he's going to come back and pick it up. So. Anyway, off he went down, I watched him amble his way down the river until suddenly he was heading out of sight and I thought, that little swine. And he was a bit too far gone for me to get get my dander up and go after him. <coughs> anyway, so I, I kind of, I couldn't quite believe it. I believed my eye as I watched him walk into the distance down our beautiful river and I thought, that's just took me completely by surprise. You know, somebody who I would have judged, clearly incorrectly, to be a, a responsible, wildlife-loving type individual, has gone and behaved worse than a, an ignorant teenager who didn't know any better. And by the way, when I say that, I mean like I was when I was an ignorant teenager who at that time didn't know any better. Because I, I probably was just as much. Anyway, so... <laughs> So I just watched him disappear and I just, I got so annoyed and I thought I better not go after him because I will really lose my temper because I, I spent some time picking up neighbours junk from outside our house yesterday and that kind of got me a bit vexed. Anyway, um, so he, he swanned off and that was that. So I, I took a picture of him kind of going into the di distance and I thought, right, I'm going to put you on the local parish website, uh, Facebook page, you little swine, shame, name and shame, whoever you are, <clears throat> probably a visitor to the town, sadly, um, and then I picked up his sticky crap and put it in the bin, which amusingly, or quite pitifully, was approximately 10 feet in the other direction, round a corner, <clears throat> now fair enough, he couldn't see it from where he was sitting, but even still, he had a rucksack, you know, I was expecting him to put the rubbish in his rucksack and take it with him. But what ignorance! I mean, I was I was just so surprised that I had my assumption. You know what they say about assumptions. My assumption, foolishly, was that because he was of a certain age, that he had some sort of awareness about his responsibility in regard to rubbish and cleaning up. But he didn't. He was he was ignorant. And um, I wish I <coughs> I kind of wished I could have gone. Turn, turn back time and run and give them a bollocking, as they say in England, so forget the expression. Ow, my thumb still hurts. Anyway, <clears throat> getting more and more sensitive to that kind of stupidity. The older I get, the, the older and the more appreciative I am of what we've got. <clears throat> I guess you have to get to that place in your life, don't you? Right, so here we go. For the hooking up it's a pretty simple thing the difference is now we've got more wires than we had before okay but in essence it's made they made it relatively simple we've got the coil split pair which helpfully are paired off the two the reds and the whites are paired together so we know what they are they are the coil split pair now i'm going to cover them with a bit of heat shrink um, i don't really need any other wires for this job um, just a, just the heat shrinky bit. I've got some nice bits of heat shrink there which I could actually use for my messy box of wires which lives under there and then gets covered in sawdust whenever I make a guitar. Or 
should I say, filled with sawdust. Now I'm going to try yonder, uh, what do you call it, thing, soldering iron. I'm just going to have a look and see, just kind of confirm to myself that this should still be working, or not that I can see anything immediately that says why it doesn't, or why it's struggling to work. Um, just going to double check that it gets done up nice and firmly, which we can't obviously do when it's scorchy yo hot. And I've managed to jam that on there. How cool is that? Now I'm going to connect it to the three pin power entry point. The power is not on by the way, it's off. So if I can just get this on the line, then I should be able to do it up. It's got a nice um a nice sort of quality build feel to it, this. <coughs> Well, it's plastic and Chinese, but it has a quality feel in that it feels a bit more pro than a home one. Now, this was what was causing me trouble the other day, was having it placed there, and then we would switch it on down the side, and uh, we switch it on there. It should run up to temperature without going error. Well, we could be lucky. Right, back to the business at hand. So, and the other thing too is here, it's, this could, this could, would, it, it's light enough, I'm not going to add more brights to this, because when, have I just turned off the camera? I'm sorry. What did I just do? They're all on. The camera's just kind of gone and reset itself. Hello. I could do a live feed with that camera if I was smart enough to use the technology. According to me, that's on, so there's no reason why that should... That's about. Why are you going? Is it the Chinese? Are they looking at me? Stop. Could be, you know, because <laughs> to, the foolish thing is to is to be able to use this um, camera. It's a twenty-pound camera. You have to obviously, you have, well, not obviously, but you have to hook it up to your uh, your local network, your home network, and to do that, you have to tell the app the bit of software you're using. Um, mm, nice sound. Um, you have to tell the app your router, router, oh my god, what's it called? Router, router tutors um, thingy address, IP address, which of course means, and you have to give it your password. What? I hear you say, yes, you do. So it's one of the most stupid, I mean, everybody's sitting here worried at the moment about the UK giving, you know, uh, inviting the Chinese, sorry, in, in, inviting Huawei, why, 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 in to do, um, to do the 5G installation in the UK. Everyone's terrified of, or worried about that. Uh, and hilariously, um, you know, we've, many of us are, are giving away control of our routers, routers, to to you know, completely unknown Chinese um, software or app manufacturer, who, for all I know, could now be monitoring every bit of transaction through my uh, through my router, and including recording my passwords and bank details as I type them in, including doing anything they want. Now I'm just a little individual with not enough money to worry about, but you know, it's that sort of. Uh, carelessness that we do things with so I think that's the sort of the least of our worries in terms of UK government Huawei, Huawei you go, Weiwei, 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 Huawei, 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 I can't pronounce it well that's a bit silly I didn't do that very far, but hey. And a hanger for my heater, which then comes back on itself, and if I'm not careful, it touches the wire. Right, so this was my little attempt at just masking off these. Now, sometimes, you, if you want, you could tie that back on there with a bit of a bit of something. The something being a little bit of this. Thanks for me, really. And fiddly. Take, take two small pieces, retaining, retaining, Two retaining sections of shrinky wrap, 
bubble now shrink shrink tubing Sh shrink sh shrink tubing and you could go like that shove they two through like that anyway yes i was well vexed at mr rubbish bin man uh mr non-rubbish bin man and um yeah it's just that yeah, it's not quite big enough to go over there is it not without a bit of extra widening yeah just hard to believe people I, I still i do actually marvel that people can be so unconscious and so destructive in their unconsciousness but you know i it's like i can't even watch i watched um on netflix the other day i was watching elvis in girls 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 you know one of, just about one of the only things that netflix has that i like along with the original star trek of course um anyway i was watching girls 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 and uh you know, there's a scene, many scenes where, you know, Elvis is out fishing. He's, it's all about him kind of running a fishing boat or trying to make, trying to do tuna fishing out of some Hawaiian port. Um, and the, you know, the typical American, no, all of us disregard in the in the fifties. Well, I wasn't there, but you know, disregard for uh, um, the environment. You know, watching him just chuck stuff over the side of the boat when they, you know, ha ha, I'd throw that thing over that you don't need because you're a human and the sea is full of things for you to kill. And it's just so depressing. Okay, now, um, <laughs> and anyway, there was another bit in that film, I remember, um, and it came to the, the, the female lead, romantic lead. Um, she came to buy this boat and she sort of beat Elvis to it. He was It was a boat that he was desperate to buy and she beat him to it and, uh, God, it's a bit of a mess. So we've got the problem with this is is we have to put we have to put the um we have to how does this work? Hang on a minute, how does this work? Blimey, uh, that one comes out of there, goes into there, that one comes out there, goes across to there, that one comes out there, goes across to there. Oh yeah, that's right, there's the jumper. Um, yeah, so anyway, he, so Elvis buys this boat that, um, sorry, she buys this boat because she's a rich girl that Elvis was after. But as she buys it, she just takes the sign that's on the front of the boat and she just throws it into the sea in this beautiful, supposedly beautiful Hawaiian port, um, fishing port. And it's just, you know, just to see things like that with, with nobody even batting an eyelid, that's like, no, you just, you know, you just throw whatever you don't want into the sea. And funny enough, I... I was not funny really. I was born in Trinidad in the Caribbean, and um, I remember my mum taking my brother and I backwards and forwards to Trinidad in the mid '60s or something. And we used to. I mean, money was obviously not. No, flying was kind of for richer people, and um, so we, we used to travel. To, from Trinidad to England on a, you know, on a oil tanker because my mother's family were connected with the oil industry. Let me just check this. Grey neck, neck one there, a the grey one, grey neck first. So we're going to go yellow is the live. We're going to push it through. It's a bit stiff there, all of this. That's the only downside of these wires. They can get very bulky. So we're going to push that. I don't know how well you can see this. So we're going to push that little yellow wire through the hole that's already you joined to the tone jumper. So we have to get it through without pushing the tone jumper out. So it's not actually as easy as it looks, because really in those two things, it make, it's a little bit difficult to push one through while the other one's in place. So this is kind of upside down surgery. Um, I'm really not getting anywhere near getting it in place actually. I've got no ability. And the thing is, it's already kind of burned. Somebody previously in trying to do it has already burned the grey wire there. So the only other alternative is if I can bend this thing down, I get a better run at that and go in the other way round. Anyway, so um, we used to we used to fly. No, we used to we used to oh god, we used to sail. God, this is to get everything right out of the way. I'll tell you the story. Like Ronnie Corbett, only not funny. Um, we used to sail. No, not sail. Chug in a diesel-y oil, 
oil tankery thing from Southampton to the Port of Spain and back. Uh, sorry about the view, it's cr oh, God. can we just make some space to see what the goodness me we're doing? Yeah, so anyway, we, that's how we got to and fro Trinidad. And um, I remember, I actually remember watching the, uh, the waves go by from the ship. But I also re very vividly remember seeing men throw their beer bottles. I can't, I just literally cannot get over this. I can't actually get this thing through the hole. Um, yeah, watching, watching grown men throw their beer bottles into the sea as a completely natural thing to do off the side of the boat into this beautiful Caribbean sea with what you could see with all these sort of beautiful looking exotic looking fish flashing through the water near the surface you could you really see the beauty of it and uh, even from a you know tanker like that um, but they, they literally there was no consciousness in those days you just people just chucked their stuff and that was it uh, you know and same same as of course if you if you're like me and you know a lot of people like a second world war you know memorabilia or historical stuff um a bit of a you know history channel type freak and uh you know when you watch the thing i can never get over is when i watch sort of campaigns you know fight these terrible battles in the pacific and so on watching the um watching the americans or anyone you know the combatants chucking tons of material overboard you know, absolutely the sea is just a means you know the land and the sea the environment is just a means to win this war against the enemy and and there's no of course there's no regard for the environment whatsoever i mean you know there's no re well not much regard for the life of the enemies anyway but so why would you why would you care about the planet if you're in this existential struggle but it just god it really astonishes me hurts me to watch all of this poisonous war material going into the sea or you know on the land okay so that's that one done and now i've got to flip round because this is upside down the next one back to front this is where the pot appears to have spun round inside from its original position and i've left it there but it's um it's a little bit a bit of a mess position wise so I'm just going to try and make enough space to get a reach. Um, yeah, so yeah, but I, I can't stop seeing it in these films, you know. And they did it, you know, when they did these films, they did it absolutely without any consciousness at all about the environment, you know. And I think I remember another, there's a quite nice old Bogart film that I really liked, um, just one of his many, but. Um, and I remember the same thing, he, he chucks bottles over the side into the sea off the de off the, um, the dock side in wherever little island it's supposed to be. But again, with, with zero regard for the wildlife or the health of the, the ocean. And it seemed to be a very 1950s American thing that the, you know, the planet was just yours for the sort of capitalizing of you know I mean I guess that's how I guess how we treated the world it's sort of very explicitly in those days and actually in a way it's probably not that much different now just a little bit it's getting a little bit harder to be so um, destruct so openly destructive but actually you know there are still plenty of people for whom the environment around them is, is purely a means to whatever ends thereafter, um, which, is, which is sad. You know, it's the same kind of thing. You know, when my the tree outside of here was savagely cut down last year, or nearly cut down, and the others were cut down. You know, it's just it's just a a thing to the farmer who owns the land, um, but to me it was quite a lot more than that. Now this is 
This is really difficult to get this soldering iron to transfer enough heat to melt this blob. And while you're doing it, of course you have to be very careful not to end up roasting any other part of the thing. So you know, I can maybe get that on there, but boy, does that not want to do anything. I'll try it. and get some added solder on there. And the only reason I do that, not because it needs any more, but it's because it's about the only way I can help transfer the heat across required to get this stuck down properly. Come on, all the way please, so I know it's attached. Okay, so that's that. These are the two new pickups wired in. And you can see it's quite a lot of stuff sticking out. So obviously I'm going to try and poke down as much as possible into conveniently out of the way places. So I still have the op opportunity to press my freshly leaded thing, <laughs> lid into place, my leaded lid. Um, let just make sure I think everything's still attached. Now, obviously, first thing I'll do is test it before I do anything as foolish as putting the, the lid back on. Now, I've not got strings on there, so I can only, at this point, say which of the pickups is live and which isn't. But that's as we'd expect. Yep, tone, volume. All is good. Now we go for the, the fun part of switching our soldering iron off. We are done. Thank you. It performed well. We then replace. Ah, we redrill and replace. So put in our great big slab of lead. <laughs> now we've got to drill our new hole as well as redrill our old holes. Old holes. So. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to restring yet. I nearly caught myself out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, once I've done this, we're into the next bit, which is, you know it, polishing out. So, uh, hmm, right, we've got to get a reasonable sized hole to start these pilot hole for these screws. Otherwise, we just churn out the thing. A new hole position here. Old hole redrilled. Here, old hole redrilled. Old hole redrilled. off, cloth gone somewhere. Right. Now um, four thingies for the thingy, four mules for Sister Sarah. Yes, uh, the olden days. But you know, I've said this before, I, I was young and ignorant to myself. Um, you know, and I used to I, I, more vividly than anything, I used to not only remember smoking, which in itself is a bit astonishing to think I smoked, but I remember pulling the wrapping when I bought a new pack of cigarettes. I remember, I can see myself pulling the wrapping and taking off the cellophane and actually chucking it on the floor wherever I was. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I was that ignorant. That weighty beauty. Yeah, you know, sometimes it, yay, these blades are out to get me. Um, yes, yeah, hard, sometimes it's hard to 
face using your own stupidity, really. But that was me. I really did do those things. Um, somewhere along the line, I learned not to. And the fact is, it wasn't it wasn't a single day. You know, it was just a growing, changing process. But it just became harder and harder to do something like that. It didn't seem to make any sense to treat the world so badly. But, um, I can't remember which way around this is now. Oh well, I'll put it the conventional way. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't, wasn't a, a single day. Um, it was a progressive process. But I'm glad I don't do that. I'm glad that it seems so astonishingly stupid now when I look at it. I, I'm glad it's, it seems alien to me. Okay, look, I'm going to save you the boredom. I'm going to spend some time masking off every bit of this. This I bought this. Uh, my, my local guy, Paul, in the market has not been able to get a stock of low-tech tape, so I've had to buy this offline. Off online? Um, and it doesn't feel low-tech to me at all. It just feels slightly soggy. Um, so I'm probably going to end up with loads of glue going everywhere on the fingerboard which or on the neck, which I'm going to have to clean up. It's not the end of the world. It just makes difficult life a bit more difficult. If you think it's not... Um, if you think it's too sticky, you can kind of rub it on the ground, pick up some dust. Actually, this kind of polyurethane thing doesn't really do that very well. Carpety, you know, um, natural fibre would have lots of dust in it, and you could pick up some dust and de-stickify it. So you could do that with your clothes and then stick that on. That helps to just limit the amount of grip it has if you're worried about it. Um, this isn't too bad, I'll live with it. But I'm going to mask all of this off, then I'm going to polish out those three grades of papers of, of which I spoke. In the meantime, while I'm doing that, I'm going to put the radio on and uh, kind of zone out for a little bit. And I will see you a little bit later when it's polished up and ready to restring, because we will be almost completely done and dusted by that point. Okay, see you in a bit. And here we are, back again. Freshly thingied, polished, and the dust is everywhere, but we'll clean it up in a second. And on this one, um, I'm going to look at whether we can realign the neck slightly, because I know that um, Al was a bit annoyed with the alignment. I think it's improved with the new nut, um, so I'll just be cautious about you know, we've got a bit of room to make a make a tweak here, but I don't like to go too far from the from the natural fit. You know, there's always a natural fit that the the neck wants to sit in its neck pocket, and if we if we sort of push it away from that and put it under tension, it can, can you know can add to things like the splitting that we've got down there, which we don't want. Um, but the truth is that the the two pneumatic bridge. It's an incredibly unforgiving piece of kit. So when they when they do this in the factory, if they are not half, no, not even that, quarter millimeter perfect, perhaps even smaller with the position of the bridge post, then the um, the way that the jaws of the bridge are so tightly fitting to the post, it's the mis I think it's a mistake that they make them like that. But because they're so tightly fitting, there's no leeway for accommodating for any slight misposition, misalignment of the of the holes of the posts. Um, so it kind of, because of the construction of the tube pneumatic bridge, it puts it puts it almost in a inhuman, impossible uh, thingy. <laughs> what word I'm looking for is uh, demand on the positioning um, of the thing. So yeah, you've got to be more than completely accurate. You have no room. With a, with a bridge that has more give in the space between the aperture of the jaws, if you like, and the um, and the post, then you have you can tolerate a tiny bit of movement, uh, or the, you know, have the post a very fraction out of true in inverted commas and get away with it. Um, so I'll do the realignment a bit later. What I have to do on this one first is just take off this extra uh, overhang of bone nut on here and it's very 
delicate little operation in this. It's going to make a noise and it's going to make us, you can't smell it, but it's going to make a nasty stink of bones. Right. And I'm going to have to do this by my sort of feel, really. Oh, not like that. <laughs> Very, very difficult to get exactly to the uh, size you want. Particularly um, because you can't get in there with a file, otherwise you'll scrape the, uh, the paintwork. And believe it or not, this way you can almost get there get a tiny bit closer than if you were doing it with a file. It's quite bizarre, but it's true. There we go. And then just a bit of rounding over, sorry. So that's taken off that extra bit of material. It's funny how the bone dust sort of flies off and sticks in the sort of patterns of wherever you've had uh, the material, uh, the cleaning fluid. What's it called? Naphtha. It has like a, a, a sticking memory. Now the other thing while I was polishing these out, I discovered two tiny little nicks up here where somewhere in the past the guitar's fallen on its face. And as a result, it's pressed two of the strings into just one fret. Just one fret all. Um, it's quite a common injury in guitars of all kinds, often the electrics. Um, and it's certainly happened to this one sometime in the past. Um, I've polished the frets out and I think it may have helped soften out those little chips or dings but it's uh, it's only so much we can do with with frets of this sort of age group um, and not it's not something I would cost or spare fret metal for or give up fret metal for we can't really afford to do that um, because to remove two spots of damage on some old frets like this could could quite easily end up um, well, it, it basically you end up costing you all the fret material on all the other frets to get down to the bottom of the problem, to the heart of the matter. Um, so I don't want to do that. So we'll leave them, we have to leave them in. If they were seriously bad and they absolutely got in the way of play, then the next option would be to uh, remove the fret. But that's, you know, that's a difficult, um, that's a difficult option itself because you then have to bring that fret down, try and bring that fret down to the level of all the others, which when they're as old as these are, is you've got to kind of half age it to half of its life. Um, and that's kind of also impossible to do, believe it or not, without doing some work on the surrounding frets too. So to get one down to the same as the others, you will cost a bit more time or life time off the, off the rest of them. So it's not an ideal situation. So you've got to really do a judgment call on that. Um, you know, it comes down to the point that if this guitar was kind of that important in, a, let's say, a gigging sense, you know, so if it's central to Al's um, stage performance, etc., then you just you'd say, look, for this, for the importance of this guitar, we we really should refret it. Um, there's no point trying to half fix one old fret because um, it will, like I say, it will cost us. Anyway, so it's just that you know the sort of judgment call you have to keep on exercising at various different points. So I'm just going to take the bridge and then write down to begin with. Um, what I was saying was 
um, the bridge, there's so little tolerance in there. In fact, it's it's unnecessarily tight. So if that if that bridge is either tilted by a fraction of a millimetre, it won't go on because there's no wiggle room. And if the post is a fraction of a millimetre too far to one side, it also won't go on. And I think it's a it's a kind of rod for Gibson's back, the tightness. Of, because when you think about it, the bridge needs mo most of all to sit still, but sit and the force is pushing downwards. So it doesn't need so much sideways rigidity that it's got built into this, which gives you, you know, imposes that limitation on you. So it's not a great idea. Uh, and it's one of the reasons I don't like the, the whole tunematic arrangement, frankly. Um, okay, so now we've, we've done pretty much everything we want to do. It's time to do the, let's see, you can barely get the bridge back on now because of the closeness of that fit. And now we're going to get the first of the four packs of Annibal Lilac, mm, Purple Eden, Mauve, more of I'm going to re-string this beauty with its extra weight, its new pickups, and its leveled frets. So as I say, I probably expect this to um, pull a little bit more relief into the neck than it's currently got. It would not be at all surprising given the extra gauge of these strings. So, and that wouldn't be a bad thing anyway because we were right on the nearly almost entirely nearly flat which we can afford to go a little away from that we didn't have to but it will tolerate it uh, i've got gorilla tape other brands are available but not as good how much do you need it's not like i'm being stingy with it but Snail guard. Snail guard. Um, oh yeah, when you're putting strings on, line all your post holes up first so they're all in the same direction. It makes things easier just to push the strings all right the way through. Now, black headstocks are impossible to keep clean. So, even though it was shiny a minute ago, it's now not. Hey look, we're seeing the sun shining, which is nice. It's been raining and cold for a few days. It's starting to warm up a bit, hopefully. I got rid of the big stormy thing that came in from the North Sea, was it? Wherever it came from. Right, wow. I might, might, uh, I might take a liking to these strings, you never know. Okay. So this is the first of four guitars, um, which I, I will have done for when Al finishes his great expansive European tour, Belgium, uh, Germany, and somewhere else that I've forgotten. Um, so looking forward to seeing the end of that and handing them over in person. It's great to you know, have four guitars from a, a single um, customer and something I, I really value and have from a number of customers who brought me four or more guitars in, in time over time um, the, the three of these guitars are pretty straightforward um, the this yeah hang on um, three of the th three of the three of the guitars are pretty straightforward and one of them, yes, right. One of them is uh, much more of um, a Colombo type mission um, because, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'll walk over to the door and go. Oh, one more thing, my wife loves your moves. Can I use your phone? Thank you. Um, yeah, this this fourth fourth one. That I'm, well, I'm saving to second to last, to, so I can explore. And assess what's wrong with it and give myself enough time to order any parts that we might need but it's a it's a favorite old made in japan strap that used to have oh god i found floyd rose i think it was that was on there 
and Al had the Floyd Rose and the locking tuners removed. Um, but all kinds of weird things have happened to it. Uh, he has, he's had a roll of bridge installed and an extra piece of rosewood at the top end fitted, um, which was which kind of seems to have worked, but um, has left, <laughs> it needed then grooves cutting to let the strings go through it and so on. So there's all kinds of weird little things, but it's down at the, well, hmm, it, the neck appears to be shimmed because the new bridge sits outside right up above the body on a block that's been deliberately put in there for some reason. Now if you were switching from a Floyd Rose to a, to a standard Strat style bridge, you ideally want the front of the bridge level with the body, which is kind of how a Strat bridge typically works, or at least, you know, the plate sits level to the body and, you know, the, the, the saddles are as high above that as they are. Um, but this thing is, is not only once the bridge thing had been changed, came back with about a four millimeter proud step on which the bridge sat. Um, but Al since then has had that shaved down, but still it's been left proud of the deck. And I don't know why, but in that case, I'm pretty certain that it's had to have had a neck shim um, or, or uh, well, put it so that the neck has a tilt mechanism built into it. So um, not quite a neck shim but a tilt thing anyway it's all it's really curious and i'm i'm sort of dying to get stuck into it but you'll be here with me every strange and wonderful inch of the way um but the thing that characterizes that guitar is and i i try to say this without gloating but is how utterly unhappy uh al was with the work he'd had done on it um, and i don't I don't know who it was, and he's not saying that that's fine. Um, and I don't want to, I'm not saying anything about it for the sake of trying to make somebody feel bad because I don't know who they are, and they probably won't know. But, um, you know, there was, the, the, there was something that I just don't understand. The, the previous Luthier, who did the some of these most recent amendments, which haven't given him what he really wants, um, have turned, um, they, they appear to have taken his headstock on this strap, and for no reason they have eradicated his personal sort of individual logo that he had on there. Um, which was only, you know, a kind of signature, but I think it was like burned in with a soldering iron or something like that. But the person has, the person who did the work, which didn't involve the headstock at all, has taken the headstock and <laughs> scraped out the name in such a way that it's, it's scalloped, the whole head, headstock, the flatness of the headstock on one on the front side has been scalloped out, sorry, on the back side, back side where the signature was, has been scalloped, scalloped out, which I have no idea why, and he doesn't know why, and it just came back to him that way, and I think he was so disappointed that he didn't kind of challenge the guy and just took it and went home or whatever, but, you know, I'm so curious as to why that was done. Okay, so I'm looking first of all for the relief, and it's a tiny, tiny fraction more, but you would hardly notice it. Um, interesting, what I notice about this particular nut is that it's one of those where the gap in the strings narrows. I don't know what you call that, and I don't know why some do and some don't, but there's a slight compensation towards the treble strings, so they, they get a little closer together. There's more, a little bit more room for the bass strings, which is funny to look at, but um, it works. Right, 
So what I'm just going to do now, we're nearly finished on this, and this guitar now weighs a pound more than it did. <laughs> this is quite funny. I'm going to, I'm going to try and stretch these strings out. Although I don't have a thumb available really, well, not much of my thumb on my left hand for this. I'm just going to do as much stretching as I can um, to eke out all of the slack, whatever it, whatever it causes it, the slack in the string, so that it stays, we stabilise the tuning fairly early on. We get to hear and feel at this point in the proceedings where we get to hear and feel whether the tuning or the nut slots are stable and they're cut well or not. Now, I don't, you know, I've gone through quite a bit of effort at the beginning not to have to tweak these slots. Um, so what we're hearing, listening for there is smooth progressive tuning and no pings. Seems about right. Um, one thing just to check now, of course, we've messed around with the posts and stuff, so we don't know where the action is sitting right now. So we're looking at, I'd say, 1.25, no, 1.25, a bit high on the E. Ooh, that's interesting. So why is, and that's uh, looking at that, we've got some room to just dial the E down to, to the ground, basically, and that's our lowest action but we've we've leveled for that action so that's fine so again one more go around merry go round on the stretchings and all sides of the thing if possible <laughs> it's nice low action on this thing and it's should be you know these these bolt on neck sgs can can work really well nearly as well as the glued neck and the only reason the glued neck ones work so well not because they're glued in that doesn't really make a difference the only way it makes a difference is that the glued neck keeps the bulk of the fingerboard way outside of the body which allows it to flex and adjust very easily which is why I've consistently found that um, consistently found that SGs, even of the budget range, are in many ways the best guitars to set up because they're so amenable. Now this, these, um, well, this radius on this bridge, I don't quite know whether this is actually correct for this guitar. Um, it seems to be slightly more uh, slightly tighter than the actual strings itself, itself, themselves, itself. So the G appears to be a fair bit higher and there's nothing really I can do about that other than um, file down the, the, file down the, um, the thingamajig, whatever that's called. <laughs> God, crude all of this, but yeah, I could file down the, um, the slot at the top, the notch, but it's a bit extreme. I mean, the truth is, you don't really notice it by the time you're here. So, yeah? Oh. I don't necessarily have to show you this, but I might have to. Where is the bad boy? Oh, Morris. Oh, Morris. Blue tip. Morris. Oh. It's oh. probably dead anyway. Oh, sorry. Sorry, nature. Okay. <laughs> it's not the first time he's done it. Um, yeah. It's very pretty. It was very pretty. Well, the only, the only saving grace is 
the new statistics say that it, animals aren't cats, ca cats aren't causing the dec the decline in numbers. So, so it's not as bad. No, but it's not it's not as not as wicked as it at first seems. Mother Nature's son. Oh God, that cafe is putrid anyway, isn't it? I mean... Stop eating it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> right. One is almost done in the SG department. It's very nice, all levelled. Plays blindingly low action. With, this is ours, is it? Yeah. With an extra pound of weight stashed away <laughs> in lead. That's a, that's a fair cost in lead, by the way. She's going to be happy with it. Yeah. Well, I always get excited about when you give guitars back to people, whether they feel, feel the difference, notice the difference, love the difference. So what we're basically saying is that the um, blue tit is only really a, a colourful, feathery vole. We don't mind it eating voles so much, do we? It's, it's always any animal. I know, I know. Oh, I'm becoming a Buddhist. But, but you are. But, I, I am with you, Buddha. But you, you know oh. that... Flaking heck. He probably needs... He does, fresh he does need the vitamins. He does need the fresh. It tastes like chicken. <laughs> tastes like chicken tonight. Oh, poor. Has that satisfied his cravings, do you think? I know he does. He eats a lot, feathers and all. I mean, that really is a testament to how lousy that cat food is. I know, love. Yeah, I'm going for the sort of, this is actually, I'm going for five millimetres distance here, which is slightly unusual, but, you know, there, those that know say that the further the distance, the more dynamic the tone has, um, so, nice. Now, the only thing I'm pleased about this darned, uh, arrangement here is actually makes the intonation part a lot easier <laughs> the fact that it's where's my tuner the fact that the jack socket is on the body although it's a crap design it does make putting it on the bench easier right so now we're going to check for intonation which is pretty much the final stage of this game i will stick it on the treble bridge pickup and we want to get most of the stretch, if not all of it, out by the time we do this. I quite like the feel of these strings. They're not so heavy that you can't play them. And they are thicker at the bottom, so you get a bit more bass heft. Sharp. the bee where it is. Let's pretend we didn't see Morris eating that bird, okay? Let's collectively forget it. Uh, forward a bit, come on fella. Right. Push it back a bit more. Okay, in which case I'm gonna I'm gonna just believe that it's like that. Yeah, it's okay.
Mm -hmm. Right, hear that little ping? That's the nut slot needing a little bit of help. And again, not surprising really because it's quite a big gauge. And the E. So all three of the bass strings need a little bit of widening. It's interesting, really. What's, what's interesting is the is the mismatch of the bridge radius with the actual neck, which is a funny kind of makes it feel funny. Now, just a quick measurement for those in the know. So it's hard to measure exactly, but let's assume and pretend we can. We've currently got, really hard to, really hard to measure. We've got, five, five plays, Five plays to the edge of the thing. Five plays three. Yeah, five plays three is a two millimeter difference. So I think we will have a go at this of realignment for Al. So let's just put this on a minute just to stop the strings going all over the place. I'm going to flatten them off a little bit just to take the pressure off the neck. Right, so what we're going to want to do is when it comes to it, we're going to want to Push the neck up this way. Is that right? <laughs> I can see. Yeah, you can pull the neck up to us. So pull the neck up, pull the neck up, pull the neck, which is that way. So I'm going to have to do it left handed when it comes to it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to undo. Welly to do this. Put an eight on the torque settings, and I'm going to slacken off three of them. Right, right out, probably. And then ease off, ease off that one, the last one, which is also. The, um, the neck, no, what's the word? It's also the one that's the strap button. Now I'm going to use a little bit of uh, thing, rubber foam, and I'm going to reattach this one and this one. Oh, yes, the other thing, speaking of. No, that's worse. What am I doing? this way. I've done worse. I've actually got worse. How did I manage that? Come on now. It might not give us any room for this, that's the thing. Right, let's have them all slack. Come on, where do we want to go? We want to go this way. No, we want more. <laughs> that's where I'm hoping to go. First one. Second one. That's better. That's even Stevens. Jolly good. And I'll tell you in a second what my thought was. 
Tong. Right, there we go. Yes, we've got more, we're fractionally more. I'd say we're four and three the opposite way around now. Fraction more onto the Triblington side. A bit more real estate over that side. Oh. oh, that's interesting. Do not tell me that wasn't properly in place in the first place. Oh, what? No, baby, I don't like this. What's going on? Hold on, that's not helpful. We have some sort of movement here that is tightened Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, let's just, let's just, what? Right, right, okay, okay. We've changed this. This possibly gone on tighter than it was before, which is not so bad. And what we've got, let's get it. Let's get the strings out. See, look, I should have probably double checked that before, but I didn't see any reason to assume that wasn't done up. Little hint there. If you're gonna do a setup, make sure your neck is already set. Now all that will happen is if this has not gone in to the same place then we may need to raise the bridge slightly but don't forget still got to do the nut slots. See if anything has changed. Okay, one exactly. And we're back to where we were. That's weird. What's happened there? Oh no. You know what's happened? No. has happened. This is very odd. Something's changed in the time between taking that neck off and putting it back on. Something something has changed. That's where it was. We've got I'm wondering I'm a, I'm a wondering. Well no. say this is it's one actually it's one millimeter it's like that's slightly down don't see how trust that the neck's on solidly. It might not be. What I also don't know is there may have been a shim under there that has moved that I didn't see. Yeah, I think the moral of that story moral of that story I would say is inspect the neck joint, inspect the neck to joint. Tiny bit of relief. Not much. It 
should be enough because that's what we leveled to. that is how it all feels different when you move the neck there you go um, I'm going to just give that a little hand crank just to make sure it's on tight the way I want this is a sort of human torque wrench really okay on 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 basswood doesn't take well that's just don't, don't know what the neck's made of but so right then. Right, I suppose time now is to quickly put it on the strap while it's daylight. Put the strap on it. Did I take it in? The house. No, nope, it's here. So I picked the slipperiest strap of all to test this out with. Now remember it's probably a sheet of lead less than I wanted in it, but it's the most we can possibly get into this thing without the door not shutting. Um, and I don't really, I can't do this without a thumb. Um, can't really get any more into this guitar, but actually this feels a lot better. Now let's, let us hear how it soundeth. Oh, I suppose I could do with some Kerr knobs, couldn't I? I don't need them for a minute.
Tours on this guitar. I don't know why, but I'm not feeling. I'm not. I'm. F I'm not feeling enough. Enough cut in that bridge. Bridge pickup. No, I could be wrong, and I'm not going to be able to see this without some massive magnification. And it's like, haven't I had enough already with this guitar? But I don't know why. Feeling a bit, just feeling a little bit th th thick and not muddy isn't the word, but thick. And I'm wondering, I'm wondering whether someone hasn't put in 40. Oh, geez, I forgot this weighs a ton. <laughs> Remind myself. I want to see what I want to know. What, 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 what I want to know what these are two, two, three. No, they are two, two, twos. These just feel thick. Alpha pots. Alpha pots. And they are two, 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 two. Hmm, modem. It's just sounding a bit thick to me, to my ears, but I am only playing it through. What, what, is, what do you call that? Fruit tea? Good for your tea. Oh, thank you. No, what, no, no. What no. do you mean when you say thick? Get a load of that. Hold that with your hands. Tonka. It's just, it doesn't, hasn't got the treble cut through bite thing that, that's designed <laughs> cunningly to fit in there. But these pot, these pots, these t -t 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 tone pots, 2A, 223K, two, 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 2.0, the right, so I think that is the 22s, actually it's 23, 0 0.023. That's what it should have, but just, it's, I don't know, maybe I'm just, I am just imagining things. If that's the correct rating, that's the correct rating. Everything else is fine. It's just my ears. Explain thick. <laughs> thick sanding. Yes. No, I had to. Look at this. Right, see this hole here? Look where they cleverly. First of all, these holes were all worn out, so I had to fill them all first so I, to even get them to get them to grip and then I, I put this one thing how does that not come out Ugh. so the first one went straight through to the hole that the wires come through so there's no way I could fill that so I gave up on that one moved it to the side 
which actually was more accurately spaced anyway with mm -hmm. the existing one. So we've got we've got a new hole, and that can just stay there and not offend anyone. So yeah, it was thick. Just it just I don't know. I'm expecting more of a, a barking sort of bite in the treble department with the bridge when the bridge pickup is on on its own. Mm, it kind of. A Still doesn't, uh, doesn't describe the sound very well. I know, I'm hopeless at describing sounds. A sort of chiming it's note. It's more adjective. I know, it does, it's so subjective anyway. So yeah. It's just, um, I don't know, It's it, to my ears it's missing some cut through. But these pickups are what they are. And um, I don't know. I could you adjust that through now? Yeah, you probably could. Um, probably. I mean, it sounds, it's a nice tone, but it... I don't know, maybe my ears are spoiled, not spoiled, maybe I'm, what's the word, maybe I'm looking for... Yeah, what they want to. <laughs> well, maybe, I, maybe I'm, I like more treble than is good on the bridge pickup. Mm. Maybe that's the problem, maybe mm. normal people don't like that much. But I'm, I'm sort of looking for a bit more glass not, shattering. Not normal. There we go, we are done. Such a... Torella. Oh, thank you for my fruity. Um, we just need to put in the... What's the call it? That little thing in the truss rod cover. Um, yeah, I wonder why that is. No, that's got me. That's got me curious. That has. Why am? Why am I thinking that it's patter sounding? Two A twenty. What is it? Heck fire. I've, I've got tons of these little green twenty two capacitors. And it's what they use in these. It is um, what they use in these yeah, Chinese guitars, Chinese made guitars. Yeah, it's exactly the same as these, and they have exactly the same rating. Oh, actually, this one is 2A203. So that's. Oh, Christ, I'm, I'm, I'm 47. I know that's a 47. That's cool. Um, do you think? Do you think I should look them up? I suppose I ought to really. It'd be funny if the number that I put in turns out to be a forty-seven, which is my theory why it sounds a bit darker than my my ears would like. Maybe I'm just growing old and I can't hear anything. I mean that's that's a, that's a fact, Jack. Uh, I'll, I'll open it up and get that number. I'll zoom in or something. No. I'll write it down. That's probably the smartest thing. And then I'll just do a little bit of research. And uh, oh, sorry about this. Oh, it's in line. Let me tell me I haven't broken that already, have I? No. So bear in mind, uh, when you come take this back off, uh, it isn't going to come up very quickly. You're going to have to get your little thing under there like that and remember it weighs a ton. Right, number is... Number is 2A... 2A... 2A223K. 2A223K. That seems to me like a 0 0.022 microfarads or picofarads, picofarads. <laughs> JT's just asked me, am I bored with the Antonia? Ant Antonia? No, it's not Antonia. It's what he called it. Am I bored with the Antoria yet? And the answer is no. I like it. That's the part exchange one from Al. Um, I'm going to go two, no, one and two, A, two, two, three, K. It's going to say, 0 0.022 microfarads, 223. K. Oh, I see lots of J's. Capacitor value. Yes, yeah, 22 picofarads. That's 0 0.022 microfarads. It's a box standard thing. 2A223K nanofarads. What? 
2A, 2 to 3K. Green, tiny green, I tried looking around, help finding. Well, I know what it is, so I don't know why I'm looking anymore. Yabadabadah, cookies, thanks, let me have all my details. Yabadabadah, in green, we know a lot of greens. Numbers that are the same as the resistor codes, what, 103? Okay. Don't know, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, two things. Anyway, it's just my my ears, all that brand of pickups. Blimey. What do I know about? See, I told you, it's purely subjective. Purely subjective. Right, that's done. We're done. Sorry about this little extra, extra detour. Just my ears. That's all it is. Go and put the trouble up on your amp and it'll sound fine. Actually, it's just as likely that these little Roland amps are losing their battery power or are losing their potential to make a nice sound full stop. They're so old and dusty. But it's interesting, I found that I felt the same about listening to the tone with the original Epiphone pickups in the house. So they're probably very similar anyway, but there we go. Right, that's done. So Epiphone uh, SG um, in TV yellow, bolt on neck. Um, we've changed the pickups out. We've added a half a kilo of lead in the back to balance it. Um, and we have ref refreshed it. No, we've set it up, um, done a fret level. We've got really nice low action down here. Oh, I've got a tiny bit of. I knew I'd forgotten something. It's not the end. A tiny bit of slot. Slotting game to play. So, Something moved when I reset that neck or reposition re that neck, which I'm not thrilled with, but I have no, there's nothing I can do about it. It's what it is, and um, I wish it hadn't moved at all, but it did. Now I'm just going to go back to these strings here, and I'm basically going to do one of two things. I'm going to slightly, uh, slightly open out the uh, slot so it's not sticking into a grippy hole, excuse the expression, and I'm going to go sideways with this here 600 grip, and I'm going to do it in such a way that I try to avoid point, um, deepening the hole any, I just want to open the width a little bit so that it doesn't grip on anything. This one is already uh, probably the, just about the lowest of the low, um, so I really don't want to lower this any further. So I'm just again going to widen up the slot a little bit. And I'm using the, the round file just to help eco, uh, open it up a tad. And then again, I'm going to just concentrate on the side of the slot rather than the front. Same with this one. So, it's quite quite important to get this bit right because um, I mean, what am I using there? What I'm not used to using. I'm going to use this triangular thing just to just to widen the uh, slot just a tiny bit again without cutting down any further. It's such an important part of this, getting the width right. And right doesn't mean any particular look or style or finish or anything. It just means that it's the tuning is going, is adjusting smoothly without pinging, and that pinged again, so we are not yet ready. And sometimes it can be because of the um, the exit from the string, or from the from the slot, and then that can cause problems. So I just want this to be wide enough that the string sails through it in a smooth fashion. So it's worth putting this extra time in to work it.
Sounds about right, actually. Still there on the A. That little tiny sound, knocking sound. I've got to get that right, and then once that's done, you get a nice playing guitar. So a little bit on the back edge there, try and widen it out, avoiding lowering the front edge at all costs. That's the most important thing. Still a tiny ping down. In fact, you hear it down at the bass here. Now, I don't think it is the bass pinging, the bass end, but it, sometimes it could just be. Uh, we've got a very low action there, and that's that's after the. It's after the. Uh, after moving the neck. We're done. We're done.